We're live. We're live. live. We be live. Yes, <laughs> <I'm just. laughs> yeah, yeah. Not thing. <laughs> we, we we've got um Vidu Hids as a secular jihadi. Oh wow, that would be fun. Yeah, yeah no, he, he he uh quite strong headed men going at it at various topics. I can imagine that would be pretty entertaining. Well, we we had him last week, but he did kind of back out a little bit, like, uh, not from the show, but like we 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 got ourselves um, entangled in an argument, and then uh, yeah, he, he he kept jumping in, but then he's like, oh okay, because because Armin got him, but then Armin tried to get me as well, but then he didn't, but we kind of got we kind of met halfway, and apparently Zagros watched it and he didn't like it, so he's he might come in and have a have a little chat. Um, it's like so literally, I'm imagining like a boxing ring, and like Armin's got Vido on the ropes, and you're saying he's got you on the ropes, and he comes back. Yeah. But, um, what was it like, Cologne Part Two? Then. No, it was about um. No, uh, no, it wasn't on that topic. It was more so about freedom of speech. Like I've been, I've, I've been thinking about it a lot. Like I mean, those who want to abolish freedom, free speech, <laughs> using free speech, should not be given a right, uh, the right to free speech. That's okay. what that's what my position is. But then you know, I mean, it's going slippery slope, or uh, then that basically, you know, kind of cancels out the whole concept of free speech because free yeah. speech is supposed. To... But then I'm saying, no, 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 you're allowed to say everything else, but you're not allowed to dismantle free speech itself. Meaning, basically, you're using free speech to to bring in a totalitarian ideology. I'm just saying because it's, it, it's kind of from my point of view. Anyway, I think Zagros will come and we'll probably okay. dig a yeah. little more further. But, oh, hang on, we didn't do this. We be live. <laughs> We've done this. <laughs> we, um, so you wanted to talk about something we had, um, oh, no, before we go into that, I want to, I want to talk about where well, you have been, you and a couple of other Pakistani feminists and ex-Muslim women uh, have been trying to do. Um, and as we know, that Pakistan ended up banning your English channel. So you said, well, screw you. I'm going to get more active on my Urdu channel. In so your ladies, language, yes. No, my language kind of like as your. In, oh, in, yeah. In Pakistan's but, language. Yeah, you. true, true. No, yeah, yeah, okay. But here is Nurail. This is Nuria's Urdu channel. Last video Nuria got 800. means the light of knowledge. So not only is it a play or a pun on my name, but also on what they usually say in Pakistan. And they say Nuria Khuda, which is the light of God. So I wanted oh. to flip it and make put knowledge in there because knowledge over God any day. That's very clever, actually. I didn't see it. Uh, I, I didn't see the pun initially, but obviously. Oh. Um, <laughs> but having said that, guys, uh, those of you, obviously, a lot of them, a lot of the guys here probably uh, are not very familiar with Urdu. And a lot of, obviously, if you're an English speaker, then probably it's going to be of no use. Uh, you wouldn't be able to take pleasure from uh, listening to Nuria in that thing that she calls Urdu. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah, joking, I'm joking. Really, Horace no. has warned me so much from not speaking in Urdu because he says your Urdu is like, he makes fun of it. And then I was no, like, no. screw it. Should I just go ahead anyway? And then people were like, no, yeah, your Urdu is actually not that bad. And I was like, oh, thank goodness I didn't listen to him. That's <laughs> true. But last week I noticed something because I was uh, editing this video. And then you said, oh, you, you thought of a word in Urdu. And then you said, oh, well, how do you say that in English? And it was such a simple, basic word. It was something like kabza, yeah. Something yeah. you're taking in your ownership. You were like, Gabza. You're like, hang on, what did you say that in English? <laughs> so now you understand my pain, yeah? Like, I mean, now yeah. sometimes if I do so many Urdu streams, I actually struggle to do this stream. Uh, but anyway, so, um, Nuria, you, you've been doing this um, uh, th this women's Qomse Khatab, so to speak, where obviously, uh, you know, the, the, the panel is Dr. Madia, yourself, and there's another Pakistani ex-Muslim atheist activist, um, intellectual. Yeah. Yeah, IW, yeah. So uh, obviously the focus is on, focus is on uh, you, you want to bring more women. And there was this woman by the name of H, and her story was so 
I don't know. He, 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 he was uh, it was tragic, but at the same time, there was there was some happiness at the end of the day, at the end of the by the end of the video, because I mean, I found I found it very suffocating for the poor woman, but she was she's living that reality. So, guys, obviously, we need to support this because, the, as you can see, it's the fourteenth episode. Even I didn't know. I thought it's only been going on for two or three weeks, um, and this is going to be. I thought that was going to be every Saturday, not Sunday, or no. uh, not not Monday. No, it was well. This this week we had to rearrange, but it should. We were thinking to make it consistently on a Saturdays because people have work on a Monday, including Good. myself. So yeah, it's it's usually very late. So, so obviously, um, uh, uh, these ladies are trying to to reach out to uh, ex-Muslim women. And for example, this lady, hey, she was from a rural part of Pakistan. Uh, you would not have Im imagined in your wildest dreams that our message could go to these these far-flung people and they could actually embrace it as well um and, and that's the whole point of uh, doing these kind of and shows Horace, be so relieved to say it out loud like feel heard because you can't even say these things you can't we were actually we went from a point where she was like you know like having suicidal ideations to her laughing about some of the requirements of islam and us laughing about the angels being outside and having to wait um so sometimes these people just need to be there's nobody around them i was going to say ask for us again this this language thing is a real problem See, told you. i told you now you nobody, understand <laughs> there is nobody around them that um can like thinks that way yeah no i was just yeah no one in her own village she probably yeah, had no one in her village. She she said that she's literally the only one. And her her sister tried to accuse her of blasphemy when she accidentally put something. So guys, you need to you need to uh, those of you who speak Urdu or understand Urdu, you need to go subscribe to Usmani Youth's channel or Dr. Matias or Nurail, uh, which is Nuria's channel. It's on my Pakistani Mohit community page. Um, we need women to come come forward. And obviously, no offense to guys, uh, you will not be given a priority. Um, and we have this token guy there in the in, in the. It's amazing. In the, in the, in the, in the, keeps it so on the right path. Keep and, and keeps himself, um, you know, keeps his mouth shut. So uh, obviously, the whole point is to listen to uh, attract women, basically. So uh, I, I think, I, and I'm I'm really looking forward to watching the next episode, which is in 20 hours or about 12, 12 hours or something like that. Um, yes, like that. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, we, and can we, I just uh, say, just just on this point, because I think it's important to note, like with the story of this lady that came in, um, we are still in contact with her. But despite everything she told us, um, as I've mentioned before, probably it takes on average about seven times for a woman to actually gain the courage to leave mm -hmm. an abusive relationship. So when I started asking her to take practical steps and sending me important documentation to get the ball rolling, she's obviously said, I'm actually fine now. I can stay here. Just talking to you made me feel so much happier. So, like, it breaks my heart, but I'm still in touch, trying to wait for that moment. But she's got to say it herself. You know, we can't yank someone out of a situation. But I think that's why these streams are really important, because what that was like, maybe the third one that the three, us three ladies got together. And um, it was that, like just an impromptu topic. And we got a story like that. So I can't imagine how many more are to come. And I see that from men's point of view as well. A lot of ex-Muslim Pakistanis who call in my Urdu show, they say, well, you know, it's kind of a therapy for them that there's no one around them that they could talk to, or, or you know, they could they could they could say how they feel about religion or or, or about their lives, um, and uh, so so if you can't or if they're not willing to be rescued out of that situation, but then at least they just want to be heard. This is so basic in the twenty first century. You're exactly. begging to be heard. That's all. I mean, it doesn't take much to just hear a person. But obviously, this is something we take for granted in the West. Um, but, you know, in, in these Islamic Muslim countries, you, you're worried. Imagine you're worried that your sister is going to find out, your brother is going to find out, and then what's going to happen. The, what, one more thing, that, like you said, is about seven times. Yeah, but there, somebody was quoting me another stat, which was very similar to what you were saying, uh, the story that you told me in one of the Twitter spaces. This lady was in Canada or America, I think. She said you know, back in the 90s, she had a friend uh, who had an uh, abusive husband or something, and then uh, the, the husband tried to patch up, and then she uh, then she said this lady broke down when she was telling the, retelling the story, and she said... Um, 
she said, okay, look, things like it's going to be okay. Divorce is bad. Look, think about your kids. So why don't you go back? And then she went back and unfortunately she was murdered by her husband. So, and then she quoted me a stat that it also happens that after six or seven or eight times of domestic violence, the chances of you getting killed in a domestic abusive relationship uh, keep increasing. Is that, is it, was there some stat like that as well? Like five, six times you get beaten up or something and then each time it gets worse? Yeah, there's always the potential for escalation. I mean, literally, it could take just it, it's you know, there's a lot of safety planning that goes into it. You know, it's very I don't want to go into the depths of it now. But yeah, I mean, from basic things like if they do go back and they just happen to have an argument in the kitchen where there's sharper objects, you know, it, it could really just escalate. So the level of safety planning that you have to do with these women who do decide to go back, little things like put your documents, have an emergency bag ready, like have an exit plan in case you get trapped in the same room as him. And there's no just little things. You always have to make sure your children have know where the oh, it's just it's it's very yeah it's intense but yeah of course there's always the potential for that yeah uh well i wish you best of luck with uh with, with the lady h um i i don't know if, if we can do any you can do anything or not but um we just yeah. keep trying and we'll see yeah but there's so many other stories like that as well that's, that's just heartbreaking um okay now the next thing that you wanted to talk about, uh, you wanted to talk about it last week, but apparently you hadn't sh you, you hadn't sent me the photos. So what's no, been happening no, in Iran? Different one. That was a different one. This was oh. yesterday. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. So there was another one yesterday, and uh, our the, my hero uh, Mario Namazi was there as well. Um, <laughs> and uh, so there was another protest. So okay, yeah, so let me just explain. So there was yeah. a, uh, so Mariam Namazi had organized a sit-in um, protest in Trafalgar Square, obviously in solidarity with um, Iranian women. And it obviously initially started off as a sit-in, um, but, you know, as good old-fashioned British weather goes, it started raining. Uh, ruined the day as usual, so everybody's bums got wet. It was a bit of a messy situation. Um, and then it just turned into that, you know, full-on demonstration. And look at this, like, obviously this is one of the young girls that was killed right so this man they were just all drawing this beautiful artwork of her and like as you can see across her t-shirt is written all of her dreams her aspirate sorry i'm really emotional these days with what's happening with this it's like it's hard to even speak but like they're writing what she wanted to be and who she wanted to be and like Obviously, in the top right hand corner, there's that famous symbol of the woman and she's holding the mullah with the end, end of her hijab. Um, but yeah, so again, it was just so energizing, so emotional, so, I don't know, it, it's just, you, you just have goosebumps, like in your entire body when you're there and you're surrounded by this and these chants and these calls and these artworks and people like reciting poetry and singing songs and shouting their names. Yeah, there was this uh, video that you uh, recorded as well. This women's revolution that will change the face of Iran, change the face of the Middle East, and change the face of the entire world. Women, life, freedom! Women, life, freedom! It's nice to see that Mariam um, was also invited to one of your. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't. I don't know the show, but um, but it, it seems like a, uh, some British TV channel uh, where she was interviewed. Um, I, I didn't find the whole video, but somebody uploaded this video, um, and uh, it's nice. Nice to see that you know she's getting a platform and she's talking about what's been happening in Iran and what we need to do. Third, I think what all governments, the British government needs to do is to really put diplomatic pressure on the Iranian regime. The women and men of Iran are fighting this regime there and then, and they can herald a new dawn, but we do need to have Western governments stop supporting and maintaining and legitimizing the regime. Uh, soon after Mass Amni was killed, for example, the president of Iran, Raisi, who is... Um, you know, known for his role in the death commission in the 80s where thousands of political prisoners were killed in the summer of 88. Uh, he was given a visa to go to New York. He was allowed to address the UN General Assembly. This has to stop. And uh, there's a question for Liz Truss who hasn't seemed to been able to mention Masa Amin's yes. name once. Yes, uh, you're a woman, Liz Truss. 
government of any government that considers itself democratic. Third, I think. Yeah. So Sorry, that uh, really gets me off. Like, what Liz Trust? What is she doing? It's uh, and I have something to talk about Saudi Arabia as well. But uh, but but what Mariam said that is what all governments need to do, especially the democratic Western government, the governments that actually, um, you know, they understand what. Um, what human rights are, what women's rights are, uh, it's incumbent upon those governments to to talk about this, and especially the British government, they need to um, uh, they need to put diplomatic pressure on the Iranian regime. But uh, I'm I'm actually yeah I'm surprised that Liz Truss hasn't even mentioned, um, and, and ni neither neither has America. I think I mean to the best. Of, I I think they have spoken about the protests, but I'm not, I'm not sure about Masi Amini, but. Um, maybe the British government hasn't said anything about uh, Iranian protests. Yeah, no. Anyway, the, the, there's a couple of other images I wanted to... Did, did you see the other one with the little girl? I just wanted to focus on that as well, because yesterday um, this there were so many young girls and they just stumbled across the protest and they were like, what, what like, what, what's happening? What are you guys protesting? And even then in like a couple of seconds, Mariam was explaining why we're there and what we're doing. And you should have seen like, they're just intrinsic support. They were like, can we hold something up? We want to shout her name. And these people have nothing to do with Iran. And you just saw these young women, like my little sister's age. And now my little sister as well is like, why wasn't I there? Can I please come to the next one? I want to be part of this. She just like, like, read, like saw some of the videos and was like like you just feel it you feel it as a woman that's why it's just as Shane Wilson said yeah you can't Liz can't be trusted I mean as a woman it's absolutely deplorable that she can't come out and condemn what's happened mention her name bring it into the more of the mainstream why are you just focusing on she's she's not even just mentioned that a, a, a girl was killed in Iran for not wearing a hijab I know there's a crisis going on at home I know there's a cost of living crisis blah -de blah but still it's a prerogative as a leader of a democratic first world nation to call that out so yeah very very just like not cool yeah there are a couple of uh, uh obviously pictures as well as your uh little uh I think you spoke there as well so we've got that as well we'll obviously play that as well these are the pictures you want to run through them Oh, yeah. So this was obviously uh, say no to forced hijab. And I actually met Khadija Khan there, the Pakistani journalist who has been on my channel previously and I've interviewed. So if you haven't seen that, go check it out. Uh, she's amazing and she's doing brilliant work as well. And, you know, we plan to do a lot more collabs in the future. But we decided to and all the countries that had said forced hijab, no forced hijab, just because of the way things are going in Pakistan with the, like the TLP and the rising Islamism, we thought, why not just add in green Pakistan's name as well to that little list? Um, not just, good. Yeah, so that's me just adding our country for a quick, please also no force to jab Pakistan. Iran are fighting for change. You do not need to go down this route, please. Learn what's happening, look around you. And yep, that's her. Thanks, Harris, for pulling that up. Um, yeah, that's thought, the that's the video. Uh, why? If you just put holy humanism, Khadija Khan, you'll find that. Um, yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, no, that's it. So there's actually a couple of pictures with uh, me and Khadija together when we've wrote, written that down. So we will also, um, I'll be putting that on Twitter later today. I'll be updating my social media. Please, everybody, as much as we can retweet the hashtag Mahsa Amini, um, and Iran Revolution 2022, let's just keep it in the limelight. We're going to do a lot more of these um Protests in central London. Um, I'm not going to mention specific dates just yet, but we will do that. So the more of you that can come show support, whatever's happening in your country and your corner of the world, please, please, please do go and shout her name and just show support and don't say that just we can't let the Iranian regime think that what they're doing is working and that the world is not aware because we are very much aware and we're not going anywhere. Those photos at the top, uh, photos of, uh, I'm assuming, people who are... All the people that have been killed, and yeah, by the restriction. In, 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 in these protests or previously? Uh, previously, because there was massive, there's collages of people, like hundreds of people. Um, it, it's so sad to see, like, that's just one image. And if you zoom in, how many how many individuals is that? It's It's awful. As Mariam said, the current president, um, and I think Armin told me um, that the uh, current president, Raisi, he was, uh, uh, he actually, 
used to go to houses or bring people from their houses and they used to ask, hey, were you against this uh, Islamic revolution or something? And if the answer was no, boom, shot dead. Uh, and this is why he's wanted by, um, uh, he's one, he's one, I think he's wanted by the US or probably International Criminal Court or something uh, for crimes against humanity. Um, the, the, there was a video that you recorded. Just want to play one of that. It's it yes. that's part of a full thing. You might as well just play it in order, otherwise it won't make sense. Oh right, okay, okay. So it starts with that. Hi everyone. I just have a few lines to say. Um okay, okay. I will try and say this without bursting into tears because I, I I cried when I wrote this, but I'm gonna do my best. Gina Amini. Gina Mahsa Amini. Gina Mahsa Amini wanted nothing more than to be a tourist in her own country for a day. She wanted to explore Tehran. It was her first time in the capital that day. Unfortunately, it was also her last. What did they do to her? What did this Islamic regime do to her? They beat her to a pulp. They beat her senseless for two strands of hair. So much so that she would eventually surrender to her injuries in hospital. And then, they have the audacity to murder many others just to cover up their immorality. And they are still murdering people as we speak. They are silencing protesters, shutting down their internet, and trying to block the world from seeing what is happening to the Iranian people. It was not the morality police that killed her. It was not the two strands of hair that killed her. It was the immorality police that killed her. It's a repressive regime that killed her. It's a toxic, hypersexual, modesty and rape culture breeding regime that killed her. It was a fundamental breach of human rights that killed her. It was a breach of a woman's body and agency and autonomy that killed her. And that is why today we must use our voices to speak to all the other Muslims out there and we scream, women, life, freedom. Jen, 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 Azadi. That's the second part. Azadi. Jen, Jen, We say her name over and over again so that Jen al and all the others who are shamelessly and mercilessly killed by the Iranian regime will not be forgotten and their deaths will not be in vain. Iran is tired of this oppression, tired of this dictatorship. Iran wants to pave its own way, free of their Islamic oppressors, and it's about time we listen to the screams and cries of the Iranian people, and especially the Iranian women, and that we stand by them. Their voices will not fall on deaf ears. The world is watching, and we stand in solidarity with the Iranian people. Down with dictatorship, down with the Islamic regime. Wow, that was actually very powerful, Nuria. And uh, no, you didn't cry, but... um. I, I was like shake the whole time. My I did. Like, I did get. Um, I, 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 I did get a bit emotional thinking what you were saying about um, uh, uh, what her fault was just for a couple of strands of hair, and she was a tourist in her yeah, own country. Yeah. She, she, she's from. Exactly. Those of you who don't know, she she was a Kurdish woman who came down to Tehran for for just t tourism. I think. Yeah, she just came down and just. <laughs> Explore Tehran. She'd never been. She was twenty-two she was years old. Yeah, twenty-two years old, and then she, and then, then <sighs> she, she got killed. Um, um, yeah, and you said it. Hope, hopefully, it, it doesn't go in vain. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I, I am keeping an eye on this. Uh, I hope that this, these, uh, the, these series of protests don't lose steam and uh it, it keeps well, on going do whatever you can do whatever you can get out there get onto the streets organize demonstrations organize sit-ins keep it trending on twitter don't just let it fall like any other news story when their internet is being shut down we have to do more i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm like but we really have to this is a turning point and we've got to stick with the iranian women we have to there is one solution and it's revolution honestly
Yeah. And uh, and again, it is important to emphasize, guys, Facebook is useless. Instagram is useless. It is about Twitter. Twitter is where um, uh, all the politicians hang out, all the departments, NGOs, big famous people, they hang out and they get to see uh, these videos and these comments. So you guys need to follow us on Twitter. Uh, Nuria and join Twitter on... spaces. Join, I, the other day I joined an Iranian protest Twitter space that was live for 24 hours and we were just broadcasting. They were like getting people live from Tehran. We were They were giving them priority and we were hearing their voices from on the streets, literally what was happening. And like we would hear their voices shaking and like, oh, it was, it really makes you understand what's happening there because we have the internet, which is such a powerful tool. We can now connect people on the ground there and they're talking to us and they say, if I, if I lose connection as I'm speaking to you, you know why? And we're just there and we're people from Canada, France, England, we're translating in six different languages what they're saying, just so so people in their respective countries can do their part. Yeah. All right. Um, let's... Um, um, Horace, I yes. have an announcement, if that's okay. And then maybe we can take Soleil and then we can, yeah, you can take it from there. But uh, yeah. I genuinely don't know how to say this, but I think that this week I might actually break your heart or a lot of you might be really happy. Because, oh, you're leaving? Yeah, I am you're afraid leaving. this will be my last Sunday scoop segment. Um, probably I won't even stay for the full duration of this. I'll speak to Soleil and then, yeah, it's it's been a long, hard decision to make, but I do have to like just prioritize certain things in my life um as you know my job is quite intense you know abuse that kind of stuff all day long mm -hmm. and because of that I need to I'm going to like these feminist conferences around the world so my days are getting quite hectic and I've already had to like pause my masters a bit but I just also want to take my channel I just want to have my time and my control more I want to give a bit more time to my family my partner my friends I want to be able to be in control of my time. So when I do stream, I can really hone in and focus on what I want, which is really kind of woman centric topics. Um, and yeah, I just think that obviously this has been really, really good, but I'm not sure if I can commit every Sunday to doing this, but I want to say thank you so much, Harris, because well, mate, first of all, for giving me a platform and co-hosting with you has been so much fun. I've learned so much from you. Um, I would never have had the confidence to carry on even by myself or do streams or, you know, carry on down this route. So I cannot thank you enough. And yeah, it's with a heavy heart that I say goodbye to Sunday school, but I uh, think it's, it's, it's just what I've got to do at the moment. Yeah, that's, um, well, I saw that coming because um, we obviously, you know, you said that before, uh, work was getting hectic and then you had to put your masters on hold. Um, and then, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's just been getting that way, but I guess we'll, uh, the 50th episode of the Sunday scoop is going to be the last one. We're just shy of a year. 52 Ooh. weeks would have been a whole year. Actually, no, maybe we, we, we missed one or two. We missed one, two. Yeah, a couple maybe, I don't know. I think we missed a couple. So I think exactly a year later. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Oh, well, we it, have a and, year's worth of uh, Sunday Scoop snippets for people to enjoy. We've had some wow. good laughs. Like, there is some comedy gold there, and I'm so grateful because wow. it's just our natural dynamic. Oh, I was going to say the, the self-proclaimed dynamic duo of Hadith comedy is no longer going to – you're not going to see us in English like this anymore, peeps. Obviously, Harris, I, I, I you're always welcome to, on, to jump onto any of my streams. And, you know, I'm sure I'll bump into you in the Urdu sphere. But, yeah, yes. it's, it's been real. I, 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 do have, I do have more of those comedy hadiths today. Um, but I, actually, I don't know if they're, they're, they're going to be that comedy. But, um, but yeah, no, I, I think it's um, – I, and I've always said it, that activism is – it's difficult. It's 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 a very thankless job. People think that oh, you know, like you're seeking clout or, you know, you know, you're you're flying around the world in private jets and meeting these, you know, deep deep state officials. It's nothing like that. If anything, and it, it does it does get heavy. It does get really really heavy. And uh, there are times when you think about it. Hang on a second. What am I doing? I mean, why, why don't I just take it easy? Just 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 chill for a bit. 
Um, and no, it happens. Having that, sorry, having said that, that's not what I plan to do anymore at all. I just, as I said, I really want, I just, I think I really have a solid plan of the direction I want to take my channel in. So Matthew Simard was saying, I hope Nuria will continue to make videos on her channel. Most definitely. I'm going nowhere. You're going to see me. I've got so many collabs in the uh, pipeline in the English world and in the Urdu world. So I am going to go hard. Don't get me wrong. I just had to claim my Sundays back a little bit, um, be more in control of my time. And I think, you know, we've kind of maxed out this. Uh, we can, I, there'll never be a shortage of stories to run through at the end of the mm. week, but I want to, I want to have a specific topic. I want to go in hard and I want to get a guest. We really kind of drill in and into that. So holy humanist, Nuria Khan, Nuria Ilm, I'm going nowhere. I just think, I need to take a break from this format for a while. Um, and yeah, I've, I've learned so much from you though, Horace, and it's been fun, but I'm like, whew, maybe I need my own space to just talk and be in control a bit more. <laughs> but, there, but, but, there, but there is, guys, it's not all bad news. There's some good news as well, as Tinu Batsha said. Yeah. House of Sin is coming there back. I, to be honest, I still feel like saying, all right, people, welcome to another episode of Sultan's House of Sin. <laughs> and how they yeah, were gonna get it. <laughs> I knew it. And there's no, there's no, um, there's no, I wasn't even ready to like say it because I'm like, oh, you can't wait to get House of Sin back and get your face on the main image and you know yeah, it's it's, the horror show again, which is I think what what does an narcissist <laughs> like me love? Full screen, me, and the other person like this. <laughs> <laughs> you need to end up get away from this format. The fact that he could just do that, oh, <laughs> acceptable. Nah, like, <laughs> let, uh, let, let, let a narcissist run a narcissistic show. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. Obviously, um, uh, obviously, it's going to be diff different and difficult because I'm not used to running solo shows. Like even in my Urdu show, like I had um, people like Stoic and Park Punjabi used to come regularly, but they have been busy as well because uh, obviously no. You know, this is a commitment. I mean, that, that's unofficially part of the show. And then um, it gets really difficult because you, uh, contrary to popular belief, I don't like the sound of my own voice. So, um, so yeah, it, it, it does get difficult, but I think I, I'll get used to it. But we, we, I do have a, I do have a, another good news because uh, last week, if you guys tuned in to see another, the last episode of uh, The Secular Jihadist, we have video vids as well. So I might actually ask um, uh, Armin and Vidu to actually do this on Sundays instead because Wednesdays is very difficult for Vidu because he because uh, obviously him being in the UK and then at this time this is lunchtime in in, okay, in Britain. I, you can figure out the logistics. That would be amazing. But just to finish because this is like my farewell, Tina. I want to say thank you so much. You support me so much. And as I said, my channel is going to be really like you know, women centric now, and you are such a powerful feminist, please. Um, I would literally love to collaborate with you. And obviously, we can go through some of the work, like, just the most horrific elements of Islam and how it lent to your story and affected your life. But thank you so much. I know you're always supporting me on Twitter, you're always retweeting, you're always behind me. Um, thank you, everyone for all of the love that you've showed me here, all the support for bearing with me as I was kind of learning the ropes when I first joined. I was like so new to this whole world. Um, so yeah, if, if you know, I was ever just subpar or pissed any of you off, I'm really, really sorry. Um, I hope we've left some gems out there for you to treasure and share and pass on. Um, but yeah, honestly, I've, I've felt so welcome and so loved and I've enjoyed uh, looking for like just spending Sunday roasting Islam with Horace or, you know, really sharing voices from parts of the world that otherwise we would never have heard all love letters that come through this oh, all of yes. the connections we've made everything i truly wholeheartedly i really really appreciate each and every one of you and of course horace i could not have been here without you no worries well uh uh amir parker is saying no, i think it's parker not parker uh yes parker uh, been a while since i've been here all the best to you nuria khan Thank um you okay so uh, so maybe I, we could I could talk to Soleil and then I'll head out and I'll let you carry on the first segment of what will be House of Sin or whatever you decide. Right. So so you're not going to finish the whole show? I don't think so. No, I think I I need to go and um start yeah acting on my new changes from now. To be honest, oh, I got places okay. to be and things to do, so I think I should okay. leave. All right. Okay. Well, let's just take Soleil. Soleil. Hello. How are you? 
good. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Yes, Nuria, uh, thank you for all uh, you've done on this channel. Uh, you, you've been here one year and it's amazing. So don't feel uh, uh, guilty for leaving. You did an amazing job. So it is so much what you did collaborating with Harris. And uh, thank you. Uh, and I hope you will continue to do videos on your own later. And I think I it will be awesome. Me too. Right. Thank you so much, Soleil. And I'm I'm so excited because like I'm not I'm not upset because I know that I'm you know I'm gonna interact with all of you when I do my streams, Soleil. I know you're gonna jump on no matter what English guest I have, and I would love to. I love the conversations we have, but it, obviously it will just be more in my control on how they go. So it will be interesting. You're always welcome and please keep sharing videos. But yeah, thank you so much for all your love and support this far. Thank you. Same um we soleil you said that you've got a video from yeah, yeah. about algerian women i hope um so, so there's a reclamation but the author allows you okay um okay so i i do we need the sound of that video or we can yes. just play it oh, okay. yes right. we will need the sound you know it's an uh, an incredible video and nuria if you want you can download it and put it on your channel because I it will. is so, I will. so powerful yeah. i don't know if you watched it yet no Look but i sent it to you. and I, I knew for sure i was going to ask you because i want to put it on my channel as well so let's let's yeah. be in touch privately to do that yeah mm -hmm. okay so do you want to put that on uh, in the private chat so i can bring it up yeah it's in, on my channel Soleil apostasy it's uh, i put it uh, just uh, yesterday if you go okay. on Soleil, yeah Soleil apostasy Algerian women break the silence. Yeah, and uh, I translated it in English. This one? Yes, this, this one. Right, okay. Let's just play this. Uh, the, the sound. Okay, right. Qatluha. Harquha. Halqaynaha marmiya. بالعقل بنتي ما تجريش هكذا يا بنتي لازم تكوني طفله مرتبه ورزينه احنينا حطي الفيلو تاع خوك وادخلي للدار بو ما تشوطيش عس اختك نقصي من صوتك وشنو هاد الضحكه هادي ماشي ضحكه بناتنا ترتبي كيما كاع البنات وحكمي سبعك الراجل ما فيهش معي المراه حاشك وش كنت ديري في هذيك البلاصه عمهم شافوك وراهم يتحلفوا فيك اليوم يذبحوك سبور هبلتي بلاستيك في الكوزينه مسكين خوك اعطي له شويه دراهم يعاون روحه ايه ولا تضرب يدها على الطابله وتدوموندي في حقها ديك الجادور وقيله تحلو عينيك وليتي تفهمي بزاف هبطي عينيك بس 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 بس. واش مامي قيمينا نهضر معاك روحي نهضر معاك او نحبك نزوجو بصح تحبسي لي القرايه والفايف فيان تاع الجامعه ازربي حطي راجلك القهوه قومي بعد جوزتك هكذا يحدوا القمجه لا لا هاد الحوايج يتغسلوا باليد ولا الشهاده مازال ما طابش تبسمي نوضي حطي اجري امسحي الفدي اصبري كي بالعقل سقمي روحك راجلك شنو هاد الماكياج استري روحك المره الفحله تخدم في الدار وبرا وما تقولش اح دوري ولي نغمي مليح هكذا نحبك ضربها تكون كش ما دارت معليش ضربي النح صح انت تاني اقسي من روحك شويه زاد ضربها سمعنا العياط عطاها طريحه تاع كلاب هي تاني ماشي حمدى ربي اخصها والو معاها هي ماشي هو هي سحراته تستاهل جبتها الروحه زاد ضربها هاد المره بزاف مغبونه البارح سمعناها ترغي تقول واحد كان يذبح فيها ما تقدرش تدخل روحك بالك باباها بالك خوها ولا راجلها ولا بيتها تاج راسها واش راح تقول <تصفيق> اختها سبوها هي تاني شتيها كيفاش كانت لابسه جبتها الروحه ايه واش دهلت امها 
قتلوها حرقوها لقيناها مرمية اللي تشد دارها حاجة ما تسرالها لو كان جات بنت فاميليا نترحم عليها بصح شوف هاي كيفاش دايرة شت صورتها بينا تجي بالعار هادي نترحم عليها شوف فيها شوف فيها مليح Yeah, it's finished. Right. Wow. You know, when I, uh, it was already translated uh, into French, it was done in 2020, but I translated it to English because I wanted uh, to make it available for more people. And when I translated it, I'm a, I'm a perfectionist, so I stay a long time to make sure every word is true and good. And I cried uh, like uh, 12, 12 times. <laughs> I cried so many times because um, when I saw it, I thought of my aunts, of my grandmother, who who lived such thing. They, yeah, it it is their life. So uh, I cried, you know. And even if I am a man, uh, I cried because uh, you know I had 50% chance to be born a woman. And in a, if, I have, if I have daughters in the future, I don't want this life for them. So sorry, if, because it is really sad. And I, <laughs> maybe it was not the best time to put it, because we were laughing with Nuria. And, um, so yes, it's really hard. It's really hard to watch. Uh, no, it's, quite, it, uh, it, yeah. it, 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 it's, it, it's so powerful as well. And, um, and, and I think that I actually believe in... Uh, things to be spoken out explicitly or or in explicit terms because it does touch people. Um, I, I don't get it why people talk about, oh, you know, just uh, we, the so-called academic talk or just try to remove emotion from it. People say, oh, this is just an emotion. You, you've all heard people like Ali Dawa. Yeah, yeah, okay, so you left this out because of multiple reasons, yeah? Well, emotions matter. Emotions count. Um, and you can appeal to emotions as well on the basis of the suffering that is brought upon you because of whatever, whether that's religion or your social standards or whatever. So, so uh, I don't know if these women are actors or not, but even if they were, even with the sad music in the background, that would not matter as long as the message is true. And, and only an idiot would deny that these things happen. And not only just that these things happen in the Muslim world, they actually happen in the Western world as well. Mm -hmm. And Nuria, you, you've worked with these people. Uh, oh, fair enough. I mean, the, 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 the Domestic violence happens in even Anglo-Saxon families as well. Uh, I don't know the the breakdown of where it happens more or less, but it happens. I think we see these uh, stats, something like one in three women or one in four women have experienced uh, domestic violence. Or actually, yeah, one in three, but one in four have experienced extreme domestic violence. So all these things matter. And uh, whether you're a Muslim or not, I mean, still these things are happening. And, and you need to talk about it explicitly. explicitly. Yeah, I um, yeah. The, the, there was this video. I'm um, I'm I'm not gonna. I, I'm I'm gonna skip it. But but this is basically it's a, it's a slap in the faces of all those who say that oh Islam give gives women the you know more rights than any other religion or whatever or whatnot. You've heard this Prophet Muhammad was the most um, you know uh, feminist person or something. Here, this guy actually hits her and. And then just look how scared she is. Um, and she's, she's just, not only she's scared of getting hit by him, but she's also making sure that her hair uh, are not shown to the public. And he's just cussing her constantly. And I don't know who this person is actually filming it, but, but look at the sheer terror. And, and this is not, it's a fully grown woman. Um, and th th this is basically the embodiment of, Quran 434. Um, the, the, yeah, the, the... and just as you said, like it still happens in the West, but like like the story we we had from H in, in Pakistan, 
over there like she has nobody to do like I don't think you can ha here at least as as Bernice said if we have a wider understanding that this is wrong you know theoretically I know obviously there's there's some racial and institutional racial problems racism problems with the police and how they approach like black or ethnic minority women that come to them and say they've been abused because they get that bigotry of low expectations and say oh it's their culture that happens anyway but like in general theoretically the police the um like law enforcement, local authorities, uh, domestic violence helplines, agencies, they're all on your side. Their numbers are plastered all across the country. Um, you can Google it, then each individual area has their own. And you've got refuges, you've got everything. Like here, you, you present, if you were like street homeless with a child because your husband's beaten you and you've had to leave. Or first of all, domestic violence is a huge umbrella. And the understanding we have now in the West is getting better and better about what domestic violence is. So co when you talk about coercive and controlling behavior, coercive and controlling behavior includes so much because there's financial abuse in that, there's emotional abuse in that. And there's there's so many layers to that as well. There's harmful practices, um, things like forced marriage or the pressure for forced marriage or child marriage. And the, all of these things are playing. This all falls under the umbrella of domestic violence. Even if you're a mother-in-law, like as Saleh was mentioning, he cried because he saw his grandmother and his aunts in that. I, I, You see members of your own family in those videos and they, you, they don't even realize that they've been abused because they don't, they think it's just being beaten. But you could be emotionally torturing somebody for a very, very long time. And that has a cumulative effect on their psyche. And then, you know, eventually that person will explode. And we know there was a famous case in London, where sorry, in England, where a woman was framed for obviously murdering her husband, but there was no defense for her, even though she had been abused for the most part of her life. And now the law changes as we get more and more knowledge. Now there is no legal like like limit on when you can report historic domestic violence. So before when we used to say, oh, that happened like five years ago now, you can't really log, like, log it or register it. Yes, you can now. Now you have like, I think it's Claire's law, where you can call up the authorities if you're getting into a relationship and they have to disclose to you whether that partner of yours has ever been um, in trouble with the police for domestic violence or he's got any cases against him. Information transparency is available like that for women now. We've got so many safeguarding mechanisms that the police put in. If you tap one thing on your phone, it will start recording and send it to the police immediately or set alarms off. We are doing so much to try and protect women. And it breaks my heart that then women that were not in the first world don't even have access to things like that. And men, and then they turn around and say, Sora and Issa is my favorite surah and it's just woman it's, so it's awful. nisa means women yeah but, but, um, you know, yeah so you know i have a personal story about about this video my my uncle he he used to to beat my my aunt in algeria so she left she went to her family and then her dad beat her up because she left the house of her husband you know, so uh, they are afraid to go to the police in Algeria because the policemen will say, why uh, why uh, are you not with your husband, you know? So it, they are so in the past, in the Middle Ages about it. So I, I don't say um, every Muslim man beat their wife. No, it's stupid to think that. The, my, my father, he never beat my, my mother because uh, he, he saw what happened in Algeria, his father, his everyone, so he didn't want to, uh, to do it because he saw the pain. Um, so, and someone in the comment said, uh, in Islam, it is forbidden to, <laughs> oh, it is ridiculous. Where in the Quran, where is the verse who says, don't hate a woman? Where is it? There is none. On the contrary, there is a verse who says, if she is disobedient, or if, if you fear her disobedience, beat her, yeah. strike her. Yeah. So the people, the women in the comment, please read your Quran because uh, I mean, it's, it, it, it's 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 almost uh, idiotic to even go through that Quranic verse. There it is. It's Quran four thirty four. It just says, "As for women in whom you fear rebellion, convince them first, leave them apart in beds, and then beat them." I mean, it's just, uh, it's codified, it's written. In, the, 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 sorry, I, I saw some comments where people were saying, oh, hang on, the West is different. Yes, it's different in one aspect that, okay, so there are 
plenty of um, anti-domestic violence um, awareness it. campaigns and laws as well. I mean, for example, I mean, I, I've i seen all of these ads, like, for example, this is Australian government domestic violence <laughs> ad, um, and, and there's Horace, constant... Horace, Horace, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I just, I don't mean to stop you, but I'm going to let you guys go because honestly, okay. this is going to be a bit heavy for me anyway. I don't think okay. I've been right. doing this okay. for the last few days. So I'm just going to take some time out right now. Cordon Blue is saying, I hope Noria doesn't give up activism. The world needs thousands of her at the moment. I would not let this movement down at this crucial stage. <laughs> I need to support her. All I'm right. definitely, I'm definitely going to be here. And I just want to say also, Tinu, um, I've never spoken to you in person, but thank you for everything that you've done for the last year and for making this show run and for all the videos you've cut and, and put up on my channel, whether through yourself. Thank you so much, Tinu. You're a legend. Bye, everyone. I will see you on my channel for my next stream. Until then, peace and love and see you around. Thank you, Horace. Thank you, Soleil. Bye, Nuria. Bye, bye. 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 All right, so... So this is what I was talking about, that you need, uh, the difference is that this problem is recognized. So this is a male problem where um, men do um, have a tendency because they're physically stronger. And instead of making excuses for it, uh, as Muslims or traditionalist people make, uh, and Andrew Tate is one of them. I have a segment on him and I'll talk about that as well, um, that this worldview that okay men are maintainers or caretakers of women therefore they have an authority over them um that is a male problem all around the world barring some cultures very few cultures um but it is it's been recognized and there are domestic violence anti-domestic violence awareness campaigns quite regularly you see these ads all the time where people are trying to tell um the people uh, that this is not okay. This is not okay. So domestic violence cannot be supported. Um, violence against women, let's stop it at the start. And and I think I've seen similar kind of billboards, similar kind of slogans, ads um, on, you know, uh, on London trains, and I'm sure in every decent Western country, but I've never seen that in, I had never seen that in Pakistan. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not, so, like, have you seen? Have you ever seen that uh, a campaign against domestic violence in any of the uh, Arabian mm, countries? You've ever been no, in? no, I, I don't recall. Yeah. Instead, they actually normalize it. They laugh. They make jokes about it. Uh, I think we we, we, we or was it you? Who we shared a video where uh, no, we you sh you showed me a video of um, what they would do to atheists um, or yeah. apostates. But but I've seen a video where they're just laughing about women and they're saying, yeah, yeah, okay, well if. Uh, the, the, women are like that then you know but, yeah it's uh that, that that's the main difference so when muslims tell you oh look at how uh, how many domestic violence there is in america the america is always a favorite pump, punching bag and unfortunately america is the worst country out of the developed countries when it comes to incarceration racism um domestic violence drug problem whatever you name it america is the biggest out of all uh, and mm -hmm. i'm not just talking about in terms of numbers because America is far bigger than any other single Western country. But uh, proportionately speaking as well, America is pretty bad. Um, but the difference is they recognize it and they're working towards minimizing it. But there's no such effort in the Muslim countries. I mean, Saudi Arabia has just given rights to women to drive. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any uh, domestic violence bill in, in Saudi Arabia. I don't think so. <laughs> that would be... That, yeah, yeah, that's comical. Yeah, well, thank you, Harris. Uh, and I hope I did not, I did not, um, because Nuria, it was her moment when she was leaving. So yeah, yeah. No, I, no, I, no. I, I, I regret, <laughs> I regret, no, no. I made it sad and uh, no, with no. this video. No, no, I know that's you, good. I know you will be uh, good, uh, even alone. Uh, I don't know if on. I'll be alone. I'll, I'll have a look now because I've been thinking about it, like whether I should do it alone or I should just go to one secular jihadist episode a week. I don't know. I, I haven't decided yet, but um, but yeah, we'll we'll, we'll see. Um, yeah, okay. you were, were good with uh, Armin Nababi. I love watching you, you, uh, you too. But once you said, imagine Armin if you are the king of Iran, you know? <laughs> yeah, I know. So, imagine that. <laughs> him, so Harris is king of Pakistan. So. All right. And, uh, Kings. Yeah, I don't want to be. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I, 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 don't I don't want this. I, I don't want that throne. I'll, I'll, I, I refuse to accept that crown. It's a crown of uh, thorns. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Saleh. 
Thank you very much. Bye. All right, people. Just like the good old days, huh? Just you and me. Just a good old Harry Salt show, huh? <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to conduct this because I'm actually kind of not used to this. Um, even in my Urdu show, um, I've always had someone just just sitting there. And um, it, get, it does get a bit lonely because uh, when people are watching, you don't know if, um, uh, you know, how you're doing. And uh, if you crack a joke, sometimes, you know, I think that I'm only laughing at my own jokes. And I'm not getting any feedback. Actually, there's, here's a, here's a um, feedback for YouTube or maybe StreamYard. Um, because in Twitter spaces, when you're talking, obviously, you don't want other people to be interrupting you. But when you're talking, when you've got the microphone, when you're talking, when you're cracking jokes or something, people down below who are, who are listening to you, they have, this, um, uh, they have this option of sending emojis. So, you know, when you crack a joke, no matter how – a comedian always needs a bit of feedback. A comedian always want to know, or oh, anyone for that matter, like, oh, hang on, what's going on? So you want to see, ha, ha, laughing about you. Yes, I'm doing all right. So um, so maybe you guys can do that as well. Maybe you can't um, show the laughing emojis, but maybe you can you can post them in there. Um, oh, okay, of course, Messianic um, Apostate uh, is also a YouTuber, and he's uh, wanting, if I if he can get a chance, of course you can call in. I've, I've left the... I've left the um, uh, I've left the link in the in in the chat section, so you're more than welcome to um, to to come and join. And a couple of news stories that I want to go through. Um, actually, you know what? Before we go further, so let's talk about. Okay, I'm gonna I'm not gonna need that. That's that's one good advantage of that. So let's talk about Saudi Arabia and what's been happening with the United States um, in the coming months. We will all start seeing, we'll suddenly start seeing United States all of a sudden remembering all the human rights abuses that the government of uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia have committed. Isn't that amazing? You know, uh, I think um, some someone here said that um, that that Biden has made a, a statement that the United States or the people of the United States stand with. Uh, with the brave men and women of Iran, but they never make those statements about um, about uh, Saudi Arabia. Biden, however, though, when because this brutal murder of Jamal Khashoggi happened in uh, Trump's time, Trump went a little bit quiet on that, and yes, you know, like he didn't want to do it, but but Biden did say that okay, we will release it, and I think he said that we're going to make Saudi Arabia a pariah state. But then he went three months ago to. Uh, to Saudi Arabia, and then that infamous um, fist pump that he had with um, with with Mohammed bin Salman. Okay, everything was fine, but now all of a sudden, I don't know if you guys are following this. Biden has just said that Saudi Arabia are going to have, or they're going to face uh, severe consequences for their actions. Now, what are those actions? So basically, Saudi Arabia. Have, which is a leader of OPEC plus and plus means now Russia is also a member of this OPEC which is which is kind of like an oil cartel uh, there's like 19 plus I don't know 25 30 countries or something like Qatar or Martin. actually I don't know about Qatar though uh, Qatar though but um, all these big oil producing countries um, so Saudi Arabia or OPEC plus announced that they're going to cut down oil production by two million barrels a day okay so that would uh, and the United States is saying that this would dictate, uh, this is going to shoot up the oil prices. Um, Saudi Arabia says, no, you actually don't know this, but we need to control. We need to not look at the American economy. We need to look at the global economy. And this would be, this is in the best interest of the world. Okay. I don't know how that would be the case because it's a simple old um, economics rule. You know, you lower the production, the prices go up. And that's what Biden administration is worried about. Biden is saying, well, you're doing this. So there's two downsides to that. A, the midterm elections are approaching and voters are not going to be happy with the rising fuel prices and Biden is going to lose the midterm elections. And to make matters worse, Russia is also going to benefit from the rising oil prices um, because then obviously India and China, the bigger um, whom... Uh, Russia is exporting this oil even at a very low price, but they 
they would be able to profit from it. So Biden administration is saying that Mohammed bin Salman is in bed with uh, Putin and Putin's going to get richer and we're not going to be able to hurt the uh, Putin's economy as much as the West would like. Okay, so that's the narrative. That's Biden administration's narrative. Now people are talking about what should we do? What can we do? Can we invade Saudi Arabia over oil? We did that before. How did that pan out? Okay. Um, so the three options that they said that, okay, number one, good old America. Okay. Let's start demonizing Saudi Arabia for its human rights abuses. Okay. But I don't think demonizing is the right word because it's not demonizing if it's true. So Saudi Ara Arabia has a terrible uh, human rights record. So people like us who are against this kind of, these kind of theocracies and these kingships and so-called democracies or republics infused with um, theocracies like Islam, we wouldn't mind that. And I think the way the United States has been um, exposing the human rights abuses of Iran, they should have been doing that about Saudi Arabia as well, but they haven't been doing it. Why? Because of the oil money. So what's the second option? The second option is um, United States can pull out their troops from Saudi Arabia. Ooh, Osama bin Laden would be happy in his sea grave. Um, but that is not going to be done without significant strategic losses to the United States because that would give Russia or China a foothold in Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia can't defend itself from Iran. And uh, if the United States leave Saudi Arabia, then that would be a major blow to U.S.'s global domination interests. So I don't know if that's going to be a good idea. Thirdly, stop selling them weapons, advanced weaponry. Now, that could be probably the most useful threat against Mohammed bin Salman. But how so? Some people are saying that, okay, well, that would uh, let Russia... Um, that would give Russia an opportunity to uh, to sell weapons to Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia would be okay. But I don't know. I don't think the United States would lose any sleep over it, even though it is a major export partner. Um, uh, I think it's four hundred in. Oh, sorry. No, that was that was Pakistan. Um, anyway, so it, it's a billion b billions of dollars worth of um, sales to Saudi Arabia. So the United States would get hurt a little bit about it, but. I think they could absorb it. Um, but would Saudi Arabia opt for Russian weaponry, especially after we've seen that uh, their tanks were filled with egg cartons? Would that be a good idea? I don't think that America would lose anything. And um, apparently India is also thinking about, hang on a second, should we damage our relationship with the West over Russian weaponry? Because it seems like it is pretty substandard anyway. So I think that's going to be very interesting. But I was watching uh, that Indian news channel, We On, uh, where they said something at which I initially laughed, and I think it's still laughable, but I'll just, in the interest of uh, being very thorough about this topic, I would bring it up. They said that the question is, a million dollar or a billion dollar question is, what would happen if Joe Biden actually loses the midterm election? Would a loser Biden be more dangerous? And what do they mean by that? And they gave references about no warring president has ever lost any elections. So if Biden loses uh, the midterm elections, and then is he going to go for a war with Saudi Arabia? Well, I'm not saying that. That's, that's just we on. And then they had some security analysts who were saying that. Who was, who was saying that it is possible. I find it highly unlikely, but they said it is actually possible. I think that would I think it's next to impossible because that would be very stupid. How are you going to convince your American soldiers that, okay, let's go to Saudi Arabia because they raised some oil prices or they killed a Washington-based journalist uh, and three years later or four years later, we just thought that, okay, maybe we should avenge him by invading a whole country. So I don't think that's going to happen, but that's just, that's just a view. I think the only thing that the United States can do is take a principal position, okay, fine, whatever that's happening, but take a principal position and say 
and 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 um, and make Saudi Arabia responsible for all its human rights abuses. Um, but everything else, I don't think if the United States can do much. All right. Uh, I shared the link. I don't know if anyone wanted to come or not. Um, some, somebody wanted to come. So, so no one wants to come? Okay, here's the link. Oh, Mustafa Sahin is back. After such a long time, Mustafa, here, here's a link. I, I don't know. I haven't I haven't spoken with uh, any Muslim on my English channel for a while. So, Mustafa, I don't know if you want to come and have a chat with me. Maybe you know you're more than welcome to have a chat with me, and we'll, we'll have a meaningful, polite conversation. Okay, I wouldn't I won't shout at you. I won't yell at you. Um, maybe I would. I don't know. Depending on how you behave, but um, but 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 we can go with that. Okay. So maybe let me let me get into my next segment, which might. Um, motivate you to come and counter me. All you guys have heard how Muslims love to tell you that Islam must be the one true religion. Why? Because our prophet made some very accurate predictions, more accurate than Nostradamus, even though there were no accuracy in Nostradamus' prediction, uh, predictions. But Muslims love to claim that. One such claim is, I'm sure you've all heard, the prophet Muhammad said in the Quran, okay, well, according to them, Allah said that, uh, when Persians defeated the Byzantinians, Prophet Muhammad heard the news and he said, mm, okay, but in a few years, few years, not three, four, or I think it happened seven years later, but anyway, in a few years, Byzantinians will, will defeat um, uh, the Persians. And Muslims said, voila, see? So, yeah, so, so basically, this is the yardstick, yeah? So you say, in a 50-50 odds, you say one country, and if you put a if you put wager on one country, and that country happens to be uh, the winner, then you say we won, and uh, there you go, must be one true religion. By the way, there's so many other people who who actually predicted. Uh, actually, I was looking at it. Um, let me see. Um, who predicted uh, the fall of Soviet Union? Whitaker Chambers, he, put, he published a book in 1964 called Cold Friday, and he predicted that Soviet Union would collapse. And there are actually, that's just one guy, there are actually plenty of other people as well. If you, there's a whole article uh, on Wikipedia, which is filled with all these names who actually predicted the fall of, of the Soviet Union. So they must all be prophets then. Technically speaking, prophets actually does mean someone who actually tells a prophecy, but obviously there's no such thing as prophecy. It's all BS. Um, but anyway, so Prophet Muhammad made, so that's just one particular one because it's in the Quran, but Prophet Muhammad apparently made a lot of other predictions as well. Uh, so let's just go through some of them. I have quite a lot of them, but let's just go through some of them. Mind you, some of these, some of these hadiths are actually racist in nature. As Muslims love to tell you that Islam is not racist, but I'll leave it to your imagination. So here we go. Let's have a look at the first one. So Allah's messenger said, the hour will not be established. This is my favorite one. Till the buttocks of the women of the tribe of Daus move while going around the Al-Khalasa. The Al-Khalasa was the idol of the Daus tribe which they used to worship in the pre-Islamic period of ignorance. Now, this is very embarrassing for Muslims. I'm really sorry. I didn't say it. This is, it is what it is. It's, you know, it's, it's from your own book, Sahih Bukhari 7116. But just imagine buttocks of women jiggling. I think maybe this might be true because I think Prophet Muhammad is talking about twerking, but the only difference is twerking around the tribe of the Al Khalasa. This is what Prophet Muhammad means. <laughs> so that's been going on. <laughs> Where's Nicki Minaj? <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, this is too much. <laughs> Jeez, I'm already. Okay, I, I think maybe I should do a solo show. I, I can let loose. Okay, maybe I need someone to actually. Um, you know, pull me back. Okay, so so Prophet Muhammad predicted twerking. Now, one hell of a twer um, prediction, yeah? Okay, what else have we got? Let's have a look at the next one. Okay. 
Okay, so Sahih Muslim 912, the sun eclipsed during the time of the Messenger of Allah. He stood in great anxiety, fearing that it might be the doomsday. You know, like, it's, look at it. I mean, uh, this is so basic. This is so stupid. I mean, this is equivalent of those uh, Native Americans uh, when Christopher Columbus went there and they every time they looked at the uh, 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 some uh, a solar eclipse, they thought that, oh, this was the end of the world. That was the level of Prophet Muhammad. Um, anyway, till he came to the mosque, he stood up to pray with prolonged qiyam ruku um, and prostration, which I never saw him doing in prayer. And then he said, these are the signs which Allah sends, not on account of the death of anyone or life of anyone. By the way, this is a reference to the fact that Prophet Muhammad's son, Abdullah, uh, or Ibrahim, sorry, had just died. So people thought that, oh, because um, because uh, the son of a prophet has died, that's why Allah is sending these signs, or maybe the sky is sad that prophet's son has died. But then Muhammad uh, dropped down his narcissism just a little bit, and he said, no, 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 no. This is not because of anyone's death, but Allah sends them to frighten thereby his servants. Do you get frightened if you look at the solar eclipse or any type of eclipse, lunar eclipse? Do you get frightened? No, you don't. And what sign, what sign are we supposed to get from it from, from a so, random solar eclipse from 1400 years ago? What was the freaking message? And that message still hasn't been delivered. So when you see any such thing, hasten to remember him, supplicate him, and beg pardon from him. And in the narration transmitted by Ibn blah blah blah, the sun eclipse. Okay, he frightens his servants. Okay, sorry, there's no prediction in that. This is just stupid. Um Okay, um, the prophet prayed one of the Isha prayers in his last days. And after finishing it with the sleeve, he stood up and said, do you realize the importance of this night? Uh, no, I don't think so. But I have a feeling I'm about to find out from the prophet of Allah. Okay, so what does the prophet of Allah has to say about this? Nobody present on the surface of the earth tonight. Listen to this point. Nobody present on the surface of the earth tonight would be living after the completion of 100 years from this night. So nobody present on the surface of the earth tonight would be living after the completion of 100 years from tonight. So unless somebody lived longer than 100 years, or let's say if a baby was born that day and he happened to live for 100, and 100, day, 100 years and two days, <laughs> then the prophet, anyway, why am I saying that? We, we have no way of finding out. But the people made a mistake in grasping the meaning of the statement of Allah's message. And they indulged in those things which are said about these narratives. Some said that the day of resurrection will be established after 100 years. But the prophet said nobody present on the surface of earth tonight would be living after the completion of 100 years from this night. He meant when that century, people of the century would pass away. So, okay. Can you blame those people who thought that prophet is saying that the, that the day of resurrection will be established within these 100 years? Because what's so special about this statement that, hey, Everyone who is alive today would be dead, dead in 100 years. You'd be like, uh, okay, I already know this. Why would you tell me this? Like, I mean, would you would you tell me a man of great wisdom if I said, guys, everyone who's over 20 years will be dead in 100 years or 80 years or whatever, especially back in those days when people didn't used to live up to 100 years. So it's not as... Why, why, why would Prophet make that statement? So I am with those people who thought that the, that the Prophet was saying that everyone uh, the hour the, the judgment day the armageddon whatever however the doomsday would be established within the hundred years so um uh, you know depending on how you see it but um i don't, I don't think i think if this is another bad prediction um look at this one um abu saad reported that when allah's apostle came back from tabuk they his companions asked about the last hour thereupon allah's messenger said there would be none amongst the created beings living on the earth who would survive this century there would be none amongst the created beings so the problem here is this is this is where it comes from say muslim 2539 and the previous one was say bukhari 601 so i believe they both are talking about the same instant and here's the subject but obviously this is the heading um so obviously a lot of people thought that otherwise saying that oh everyone would be dead in 100 years that's a very silly unnecessary statement okay and anus reported allah's messenger is saying i and the last hour have been sent like this he while doing it joined the forefinger 
with the middle finger. So Prophet Muhammad said that I and the last day have been sent like this. Now that means, you know, Prophet Muhammad, you know, uh, uh, this should have happened already. This is another false prediction. Uh, the last hour should have been established by now. Um, there, there's another hadith. I don't know if it's in there or not. He said that Prophet Muhammad said that um, I, uh, I I came so close to the judgment day that I that I uh, that the judgment day almost preceded me, like almost, like it almost came before me. Like I'm I'm, I'm so close to it. Um, I don't think 1400 years is can can be defined by so close in in human terms, unless uh, Muslims can say. Ah, oh, Prophet Muhammad was talking about the geological terms. <laughs> okay, in that case, it could be a million years. Who knows? Um, but yeah, you can expect anything from our Muslim friends. Anyway, I saw Jabir bin Abdullah swearing by Allah that Ibn Sayyad was the was the Dajjal. I said to Jabir, how can you swear by Allah? Jabir said, I have heard Umar swearing by Allah regarding this matter in the presence of the Prophet, and the Prophet did not disapprove of it. Okay, I think it's in relation to another one, but I can't remember. But anyway, so he said Dajjal. Oh, yes. Yeah, so the point... Um, why he called him the Jal? They say that the Jal is only going to arrive near the end times. So if the Jal was running around, whoever this guy is, even Sayyad or something, and if someone says that oh the Jal has already arrived and Prophet Muhammad did not disapprove of it, then it means you know either the Jal story, um, uh, the Jal arriving just before the Judgment Day is false, or there is going to be no Judgment Day. Another. Prediction. You swear by Allah, he said, I heard Umar swearing that in the presence of the Messenger of Allah, but the Messenger of Allah did not make any objection to it. So this is the same uh, point about the Jal, the Antichrist. Uh, this is Sunan Abu, Abu Dawud as well, Sayyid Bukhari as well. And th these are both Sahih Hadiths. Okay, look at this, how paranoid our dearly beloved Prophet was. That the Prophet once came to her in a state of fear, Zainab bint Jash. This is the same Zainab that used to be Prophet Muhammad's daughter-in-law, and then he said, Oh, Zainab, <laughs> Allah has uh, married you to me. Sorry, not my... I, I can't do anything. Allah, Allah wants it that way. Come on, let's go. <laughs> so anyway, so the, uh, the Prophet once came to her in a state of fear and said, None has a right to be worshipped but Allah. Woe unto Arabs from a danger that has come near. An opening has been made in the wall of Gog and Magog. And according to Yasikati, um, um zombies from the walking dead gog and magog like this making a circle with his thumb and index finger so he's saying that opening has been made so the wall has been breached so they're coming the gog and magog are coming but then a bit the judge said oh let's message shall we uh, shall we be destroyed even though there are pious person amongst us he said yes when the evil person will increase so what happened the guy was obviously deluded and he was he was just he was he was paranoid. He was just losing it. Prophet was losing it. Anyway, there, there are a few more of these. I heard the messenger of Allah saying the last hour would come when the Romans would form a majority amongst people. Okay? The last hour would come. It's not it's not would would not come before this happened. It's actually the last hour would come when the Romans would form a majority amongst people. Now this is not the Rome of today, Italy, the insignificant Italy that has no footprint on global politics or superpower, or, or in military sense. This is the Byzantine Empire that the Prophet was talking about because Byzantine Byzantine Empire was the local superpower, or actually was a global superpower at the time. So Prophet Muhammad is talking about that Rome. Look, the Byzantine Empire has been dead for 600 years, or 1428, or 1448, whenever that happened. Um, Amma said to him, see what you're saying. He said, I say what I heard from Allah's Messenger. Therefore, Thereupon he said, if you say that it is a fact, for they have four qualities. They have the patience to undergo a trial and imme immediately restore themselves to sanity, blah, 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 whatever. I think the rest is irrelevant. But, but look what happened. This is a Sahih Muslim 2898 hadith. But the last hour would not come when the Romans, uh, last hour would come when the Romans would form a majority amongst people. Now that's, that's not going to happen. It's never going to happen now. Italy is never going to become a superpower. Okay. Um, another one. Surah Nabi Dawud 4294. The prophet said the flourishing state of Jerusalem will be when Yathrib is in ruins. The ruined state of Yathrib, Medina, will be when the great war comes. The outbreak of the great war will be at the conquest of 
Constantinople and the conquest of Constantinople when the Dajjal comes forth. He, the prophet, struck his thigh and or his shoulder with his hand and said, this is as true as you are here or as you are sitting. So, you know, Constantinople fell. No Dajjal came. No um, end of the world came. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. The Prophet said the greatest war, this is another one. This anyway, this one is Daif, so let's not include that one. Sayyid Bukhari, I will narrate to you a hadith, and none other than I will tell you about what I heard about after it. I heard that Allah's messenger saying, From among the portents of the hour, the following the religious knowledge will decrease by the death of religious learned men. We can only dream. Religious ignorance will prevail. There will be prevalence of open illegal sexual intercourse. Oh, you evil people, the evil West. You guys have been doing it for a thousand years or thousands of years. Uh, that, nothing special about it. Women will increase in number and men will decrease in number. So much so that 50 women will be looked after by one man. Oh, isn't that every incel's best dream? Anyway, again, these, these are the kind of hadiths that Muslims actually believe in it. That's not going to happen. But by the way, I think there are more uh, men than women initially at birth. Um and, and commonly, Muslims also think that um, there are more women than men. Um, sorry. Yes, Muslims also. Zakir Naik also says that there are more women than men. And that's why Allah ordained that uh, Allah allowed men to have four wives. <laughs> so, anyway, so, 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 yeah, there you go. So, so, according to this, I think every man should be allowed to have 50, 50 wives. Oh, boy. How are you going to manage that? While the prophets was... Uh, Okay, yeah, that's another stupid one. When the power or, or authority comes in the hands of unfit people, then wait for the hour. Unfit people, yeah, okay, well, we've always had people who are capable, and then, then there are people who are incapable, and then incapable people are replaced by capable ones. I mean, that's just been going on for thousands of years, so big deal, another vague, stupid hadith. Um, okay, um, there was one more hadith that I really want to show you guys um, regarding the Constantinople one. I think it was. Um... Oh, yeah. Look at this one. Look at this one. Allah's messenger said the hour will not be established till the sun rises from the west. And when it rises from the west and the people see it, they will all believe. They'll be like, oh, God. The sun has risen from the west. And that is a time when no good will it do to a soul to believe them. Anyway, so you know what Muslims say to that? I actually, somebody sent me an article and they said that, you know, the pole reversal thing and compass will point to to south because uh, poles will reverse or they reverse or every million years or so. I, I don't know, however many million years or so. They were saying that since north will become south and south will become north. Therefore, technically speaking, the sun will be rising and, and obviously east and west will be reversed as well. So the, <coughs> so the sun will rise from the west. There, voila, there you go. Prophet Muhammad was right. So um, obviously that's just pure semantics and stupidity because we can simply call, um, we can simply say that now our compass is pointing towards south instead of north. Because it's not like we're going to see suns coming from there. And Prophet Muhammad didn't know anything about the pole, pole reversal. He literally meant that you would see the sun rising from the west and setting in the east. That's what he thought. Um, but obviously that's never going to happen. And that's another BS that Muslims like to tell you. Um, there you go. This is that hadith that I was talking about that Prophet Muhammad said that uh, I've been... Um, Sahib al-Albani, the message of Allah said, I have been sent at the onset of the hour. Muslim Dhamma 22947. I heard the Prophet say the hour and I have been sent together such that it almost preceded me. So um, what happened? Guys, why do you believe in this crap? This is absolutely pathetic and stupid. Um, and then sometimes Prophet Muhammad would say these things as well. He would say, the prophet said, the keys of the unseen are five. And then he recited, verily, the knowledge of the hour is with Allah alone. Then someone should ask him, like, why the hell are you telling us that, oh, yeah, it's going to happen then, or Byzantine would fall, and then it's going to happen, Dajjal's going to, what the hell are you talking about? 
So obviously, Prophet Muhammad played from both sides of the tennis court. Um, or, or in cricket terms, he was also a bowler, and he was also a batsman. He was also the, emp the umpire, and he was also the fielder. And he was also the spectator. <laughs> okay, um, another one. Um, the last hour will not come until the two parties of Muslims confront each other, and there is a large-scale massacre amongst them, and the claim of both of them is the same. Yes, yeah, so this probably was, um, was narrated uh, way after uh, Prophet Muhammad's death. Uh, to somehow justify uh, uh, the Sunni Shia conflict, it, it, it's got all the all the ingredients of um, all the hallmarks of that. The last hour would not come until the Muslims fight with the Turks of people whose face. There you go. This is a uh, um, let me. Let, this is a racist part. With the Turks of people whose faces would be like hammered shields, wearing clothes of hair and walking with shoes of hair. Again, this also looks like it was created. Way after, this is when probably Muslims were fighting the Mongols, maybe. Um, um, and, and they're saying hammered shields. Obviously, this is a racist jibe by uh, whoever uh, narrated this hadith. Probably, probably not the Mongols, but maybe fearing Chinese or people coming from the East, maybe. Obviously, this is the and hence the reference of hammered shield, uh, because that's what they used to say about people from the, people from the East. Um, uh, another one. The prophet said the hour will not be established till a man passes by a grave of somebody and says, would that I were in his place. <laughs> I mean, prophet Muhammad just used to make this shit up. <laughs> he would just say something randomly. But basically what he's trying to say, he's basically trying to say that, oh, because the judgment day would be so ugly and horrible that people would be saying, oh, I wish I was, I, I didn't see this day. I wish I was in, in the grave already. But then in other places, obviously people from the grave would also be risen. That would be one hell of a Walking Dead show. Um, okay, so who are these? Um, th th there's another hadith. Look at this one. The hour will not establish until the happiest of people in the world is Luca bin freaking Luca. Now, who the hell are these Luca bin Luca people? Jamia Tirmidhi 2209. So the hour will not establish. Are, are they like the Norwegians? Who, who are the happiest people on earth right now? Let's see. The happiest people on earth today. Okay, uh, index. Let's see. Okay, Finland ranks as the world's happiest country based on 2021 report with a score of 7.8 out of total. Denmark, Iceland, Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, honorable mention, Bhutan. Mm, now, which one could it be? Does, uh, it, it, did, Prophet <laughs> did Prophet Muhammad think Finland is going to be Luca bin Luca? <laughs> obviously not prophet muhammad had no idea what the hell he was talking about this is what he was talking about luca bin luca were apparently uh who they found narrated that rasulullah said a time will not come when the most when the most fortunate people in the worldly affair will be luca bin luca in other words he said soon the luca ibn luca will take over this world the word luca is used to indicate foolishness oh the Good old Finnish. Yeah, you foolish people. Uh, ignorance or unworthy characteristics. Luca ibn Luca is a mean fool, son of a mean fool, son of a... <laughs> who, who, fo who follows purely his whims and desires. Oh, that's why they say you follow your whims and desires. There you go. That's why people like Farid and, and uh, Hakikachu and all these guys, they say, oh, you, you just follow your whims and desires to achieve this world at the expense of moral or religious value. So, you know, you want to just go to a strip bar, for, you know, just to follow your whims and desires and, you know, being moral, you know, following moral decadence. He will be the most fortunate in terms of respect, wealth, status and luxury. He will be. OK, so you you, you get the gist. So anyway, so this, that's just some of them. I've got like 20 other um, predictions from the Quran as well, and I think we'll probably do it some of the time. So I don't know. I hope that. Um, that motivates where Mustafa Sahin. Can, do you want to do you want to come and have a chat with me? You've been talking about me for nearly five years now. Here's a link. Do you want to come and maybe explain these hadiths to me, and uh, maybe we can talk a little bit? Oh, Morani's here. Morani. Hey, Harris. How are you? Good. How are you? What would you like Good. to say? Uh, well, uh, it's so sad to hear that Nuria is leaving. Yeah, and uh, I'm glad to hear that this other dude. I uh, heard him uh, on Galif channel a few times. What's his name again? 
Who? This guy. This there was this on the show with Nuria. Uh, this person, man. This guy from Iran. This guy who? who played the video just now. Oh no, no, this is not from Iran, man. He's Algerian French guy, Soleil. Uh, Soleil, Soleil, Soleil. Yeah, Soleil. what about him? No, nothing, nothing. He's he's a good guy. But what I was saying is that Nuria, I'm so uh, I'm so sad to hear that you're leaving. But please uh, do come in every now and then. Come see hi. I would appreciate it. And yeah, Soleil's a good guy, very good guy. I heard him uh, with the uh, Galip. Uh, he's he's a very good guy. So that's all I wanted to say, really. And I I listen to your channel all the time. But uh, I really don't have any questions. I just came to say what I just said. All right. Yeah. All okay. right, sir. Thank you. All right, people. Uh, where is where where is so, so nobody wants to come? Nobody wants to have a chat with me. Like I'm um I want to I want to have a chat. Or maybe we should talk about Andrew Tate. Should we talk about Andrew Tate? Now I I, I spoke about Andrew Tate with Vidu and um. Uh, I'm in the Barbie and I'm in the Barbie is off the view that Andrew Tate is an idiot. And I was like, well, he's not really an idiot. He's clever. He knows how to, you know, he knows how to say the things that matter, that, that touch people. And he's very proud about it. He's very proud of that. He's, he boasts about it. He said, Oh, you people have viewers. I have fans, you know, like fans as if like, that's like cult following. That's not something to be proud of. Uh, that means like, you're just, you know, you're just saying the things that, those people want to hear. Uh, I don't want to have fans. I want to have uh, people who listen to me, people who agree with me, disagree with me, and then move on. Yes, it can be frustrating at some point, but I don't want a cult leadership, uh, be a cult leader or cult following. Um, so anyway, so he says a lot of silly things. And I don't know why some people, and again, it's like one of the, this is a problem when you're dealing with cult followers. This is a problem like, for example, no matter what you say to someone like Daniel Hikikutu, he's, People on his side will say, ah, oh, we won, we won. They would always say that. And that's the same thing that happened with Andrew Tate and um, Piers Morgan. I listened to the whole interview, and I think that was a fairly balanced interview. Uh, for example, he asked him a point-blank, straightforward question. He said, well, do you support um, Alex Jones? He's like, oh, I don't support them. He's like, okay, well, you share the platform with him. Um, and then fair enough, you could say, and Andrew Tate was right on that. He did like, I, I could share a platform with so many other people. I don't have anything against that either. I think you should be able to share the platform. But then when he mentioned Sandy Hook massacre and he said, well, this guy de denies it ever happening. He's a conspiracy theory peddler. Could you not condemn him? He just did not condemn him. He's just saying, oh, well, I don't know. I don't know. Everyone's got closet uh, skeletons in their closets. I don't know that, but hang on. Why don't you just say that? Oh, First of all, that's not true. He didn't know that. I think he, everyone knew, everyone knew about that, that he, he, he denies um, Sandy Hook massacre and he made fun of the victims' families, the, the families of Sandy Hook massacre's um, uh, victims. They were bullied. They were harassed on the streets, set off uh, by goons, set off by Alex Jones' conspiracy theories. So... How hard is it just to say, for example, Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan spoke to him, right? Now, Joe Rogan confronted him about Sandy Hook massacre, but there's a problem with Andrew Tate. He didn't want to, you know, he didn't want to ruffle his feathers. He, he he just wanted to like, okay, let me, I've come here. Let me take some of your followers because I want fans. That's what Andrew Tate does. So that's just one part of it. If I was there, I would have said, look, I know that was his view. I don't agree with that view. And I actually confronted him on that view. End of story. You win, Andrew Tate. But he didn't. He didn't say it because, as I said, he's a crafty bastard. He would um, he he would he would only say the things that his people want to hear, or that obviously the echo chamber he wants to satisfy. Yes, uh, filled with insults and stuff. But anyway, um, but here's another video that uh, Piers Morgan confronted him on. And if you listen to the whole thing, and you're like, "What the hell is he saying?" Just freaking. He, he's again. Then he tries to play like Prophet Muhammad. He tries to play from both sides of the tennis court listen to this views like this so i think my sister is my her husband's property yes when a bride is walking down the aisle to marry the groom the father walks next to her and gives her away true or false oh Tate's opinions on mental illness are equally controversial i don't believe don't 
I'm not asking about depression because I don't believe it. If you're asleep in your bed in the middle of the night and you hear a noise and you believe right. in ghosts, now you're afraid. But you don't believe in ghosts, ask the wind and you go back to sleep. You give the ghosts power by believing in them. Well, this time every major social media platform banned Tate amid a global backlash of concerns about his influence on the young people who watch him. The copies of his video. I think there's attractive people. Uh, that's, that's a loaded question. I don't know. Well, it's not really, is it? I, I can't you know say, why I'm asking you. Of course I do. But I can't sit well, here and say. Viewers, don't know Sorry, I think, I think I'm, probably I can't play the whole video. But so on his comment of uh, women being men's property, including his sister, that just shows how he sees men and women relationship. And then he first said, oh, you know, he, he tried to blame the questioner. He said, well... Um, you know, I, I wasn't very famous back then. I don't know what, what would be the repercussions of my words. So, so the genuine question is, the natural question is, Piers Morgan asked, well, so do you regret saying that? Can you rephrase that? And then he didn't rephrase it either. He said, no, I genuinely, I actually do believe, and, um, the, maybe not the property, but then he would try to, he try to run away from it rather than addressing it. He goes, no, men, I'm responsible for women. I, I reckon I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to lay down my life in defense of a woman. Okay, that's fine, but that doesn't mean that she's your property. So, and then he gives the scenario and he says, okay, well, you can't tell a woman not to go outside. He said, no, I can because I'm responsible for her safety. So no, and Piers Morgan says, no. So you can say that I think it's probably been, probably not best for you to go outside right at this time because of so-and-so reason and I care about you, I love you. But it, but if she does go, maybe there's so many other things you can do. You can go with her or you can say, okay, well, if something happens, then you know, you're responsible, but you cannot hold her down. But surprisingly, surprise, surprise, some conservative people down underneath that video, they were saying that. They were saying, yeah, look, some women were saying, yes, I would love my husband to be like this, be more authoritarian, yeah? And, uh, and, and that's the reason why feminists and any decent person, because, you know, I think it's more... Um, it's not authority. Oh, sorry. He said that I need to have an authority over my woman um, if I'm responsible for her well-being. No, you don't. You don't need to have an authority over your woman. You need. You can have a love um, a, a, a relationship based on equality of love and respect. But if your wife or your girlfriend walks out on you and says, well, you know what? Screw you. I don't believe in this. I, 1 a.m. at night. This is a rough neighborhood. I'm going to go. I know it's a difficult thing. I know you don't want to sit back because, you know, like even if you've had an argument, you, you, you don't want to let go of someone you love and you say, okay, well, I know something bad's going to happen to you. So, okay, I'll come with you. Okay. Or maybe I'll call you an Uber so you can go somewhere else. There's so many other ways, but you cannot hold her down and pull out your authoritarian card. You can't do that because then this is unlawful. Um, what, what, what's the word? Um, what, what, what's, what's the word when you... Not abduct someone. Where's Nuria when you, when you need her? Must take a word of incarceration. Yeah, when you, when you hold someone against their will in a house, then you're doing that. That's, that's a crime. So you can't really do that. So uh, that's one point. Um, so women are not property, Andrew Tate. But, you know, I actually, one of the videos that I'm in, Vidu and I were talking about Andrew Tate, and then we, we actually did get some Andrew Tate fanboys and fangirls comments. Fanboys probably incels. Um, fangirls. Oh, anyway. Um, so the, the other point he makes in reference to this, when he couldn't defend his authoritarian comment or property comment, he says, well, Piers, why are you arguing with me? Then go and argue with Quran and, um, and the Bible. This is, where, this is where Piers Morgan, I think, uh, the got a bit weak in his argument because he said, oh, I'm a Christian, but I don't see it like that. Well, sorry, that's your problem. I would have said, well, this is why I'm an atheist. This is why I throw all those books in, in the dustbin. So um, he, some ex-Muslims, uh, or actually a lot of Muslims are actually loving Andrew Tate because he's he made a couple of statements like, oh, look, Islam is the only religion that enforces its rules and uh, only the followers or adherents of Islam uh, are the best defenders of their faith, whereas in Christianity, nobody likes to defend their faith. So a lot of Muslims are like, yay, Andrew Tate, yay, brother, come join this, join our religion. But he's, I think, made, made it quite clear that he's a conservative Christian. Um, but um, but Islam, again, like if you're going to fanboy Islam, or if you're going to, again, he's, he's a sucker for followers. Oh, sorry, fans. He's a sucker for fans. And if you're going to say that, well, Islam doesn't like, to be honest, this is one of the very good things about Islam. Islam actually doesn't like ostentatious display of wealth. But he loves to show off his his cars and you know boats and yachts and all of that and private jets and uh, he he and again 
paradoxically, he actually shits on the system as well, the very system that feeds him. Um, but anyway, so um, Andrew Tate is, yeah, he's somebody just wrote, he's, a, he's actually a charlatan. He, he would say the things that would, that would make his crowd happy. He would never say anything that is, uh, that, you know, that, that, that is liberal per se, but fair enough. You're allowed to be, cons uh, to be a conservative, uh, but your views are abhorrent. They're disgusting. And, and we discussed that, you know, like he's, he was fanboying Putin as well. I mean, come on, you're a fanboy. Putin is the most misunderstood man. All right, Mr. Andrew Tate. Why don't you tell us about all the good old years you've spent with Vladimir Putin? Why don't you tell us what's going through his mind when he's when he's authorizing his military to drop bombs on civilian facilities and kill children? What maybe you know? Please forgive us for thinking that he's a mad dictator maniac. Why don't you tell us with all the good time that you've spent with him? So again, he's just saying that because we've seen that conservatives are fanboying Vladimir Putin. Conservatives like to shit on the liberal United States values. They love to shit on them. Yes, some conservatives are actually, you know, they're, um, they're, they're very patriotic as well. But again, but they, at the same time, it's very paradoxical. I mean, we're, we're living in funny times. These people love um, uh, Putin as well. I mean, Republicans, a lot of Republicans love Putin as well. Obviously not Republican senators or, or, or politicians because they obviously... Uh, they know, they understand it a bit more. But but these conservative ideals, you know, like, I mean, I, I don't know, like, what, what's his obsession with Putin? So there you go. That's why he said it. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I think, uh, yeah, I think I've spoken enough about him. <laughs> yeah, water is turning frogs gay. There was another one, I think, on... Um, yeah, oh, by the way, uh, Joe Rogan is one of... You know, like he's a massive alien invasion UFO kind of fan. But even Joe Rogan was like taken aback when Alex Jones was saying, they're doing something. There's some secret experiments taking place. I mean, I just don't believe that these people exist in this world. Maybe there's too much free time at, at their hands. The, 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 they believe in these um, conspiracy theories. There you go. We have another fanboy of uh, Andrew Tate. Har Sultan, you don't even have a Toyota. Um, okay, well, okay. I, I don't, I don't, I don't have a Toyota. That, that's that's actually true. But um, what does that prove, though? Or, or more importantly, what do you have? Why are you polishing Andrew Tate's shoes? Why? You know, at least you know, at least I don't polish anyone's shoes. At least I don't fanboy anyone. At least I have my own presence. At least I'm allowed to to speak my mind, but you can't. Okay, now I'm acting like Andrew Tate. Ah, it's fun. Let me say it again. Who are you? How many people know you? Israel Odain? Nobody. So I'll just go and polish shoes. Okay. Uh, what else should we talk about? Okay. Um. What else should we talk about? Why is someone... Oh, Nostradamus is here. Let's talk to Nostradamus. <laughs> Nostradamus, what, what's what's the prediction? <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi, Harris. Uh, I'm actually calling for the first time, I think. I have never right. been in before. Yep. I am calling welcome. from Australia. <laughs> oh, welcome. Well, what are you doing up so late? <laughs> What's that? Well, what 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 are you doing up so late? I mean, this is obviously my my you know like I I don't have a choice uh, because you know the rest of the world is awake when Australia is sleeping. <laughs> it's not sleeping yet. It's about I'm not I'm not in the West Australia. I mean I'm not in the Eastern side. I'm from the Western mm -hmm. side. Yeah. So okay. anyway, I mean I just wanted to say that uh, I'm technically an ex-Muslim. Um, uh, was originally converted to Islam, so almost uh, I would say probably about twenty years ago. Right. Yeah. I'm so, what were you in? What were you originally? I was a born Hindu. Right. Yeah. So, so you were a Hindu. You were born in mm. a Hindu household, mm. but then you became a Muslim twenty years ago. So, tell me what made you embrace Islam. <laughs> That's an interesting question because I, I'm from one of the Southeast Asian countries. So where 
while I was uh, in the university, I fell in love with a born Muslim. Love jihad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah. So the rule in common that country, story, isn't it? Uh, yeah. So we need to convert. But to be frank, um, so you sold your religion for a woman. <laughs> but anyway, to be frank, it, it did make. See, I'm I'm from a country where um, they make it's a I would say a sugar coated romanticized version of Islam. Yeah. Okay. So they give you all these kind of beautiful stories and so on. So I did go. Let me let me let, let me let me ask you a question. Did they tell you that story? The Prophet Muhammad was so nice that there was this old woman who used to throw rubbish at Prophet Muhammad. Yeah, that's a very common story. Yay! <laughs> and do, and now you know it's blocks. It's, it's, it's all shit. It's not true. Yeah, bullshit. They will tell you that Islam abolished slavery. You know, and you know, Aisha was twelve years old. You know, oh, really? Even twelve was bad. Old. But but then you could say, but but you could say that okay, well I'll come back in those days. Yeah, all right, twelve. Oh, King King Henry. Their favorite one is oh, King Henry the Eighth has the, a twelve-year-old wife as well, or King of yeah. England. Some King of England had twelve-year-old. Okay. By the beginning, so, yeah. when I was studying uh, Islam from some of the academics, all this sugar coated is there. But one thing that attracted me was the monotheistic part of of uh, Islam. That's uh, you right. know, compared to the polytheistic aspect that I came from. So I was a practicing Muslim, to be frank. You know, even though I may not pray five times a day because of my job, but I do pray at least twice and um, and fasting during fasting month and so on. Now, all this, uh, I mean, when I left that country and came to Australia, and that's when internet also boomed. And I think that's where we started getting a lot of other informations coming from all over the place. And uh, I must thank you because you're one of the YouTube that I actually went to at the beginning of my doubts a few years oh, ago. Right. Yeah. Right. I think my doubt was, uh, was uh, I think about two years ago, two, three years ago. Right. Yeah. So we started That's doubting right. Islam two years ago, and I'm one of the yes. people that you were listening to, and I'm assuming, obviously, you were listening yeah. to other people as well, because that was the booming time of ex-Muslims. Yeah. A lot That's of ex-Muslims were just popping true. out, and the novelty yeah. factor was there. A lot of people are talking about it. And a lot of people are like, hang on a second, what? I heard something else. So yeah. so, I've, so fast track forward. So now you're saying, okay, so 20 years later. So what mm. happened? So do, do, do you mind if I ask what happened to your marriage? My marriage is still on. That's another interesting thing that I wanted to just mention. Is that my you naughty man? You converted. You you made your wife ex-Muslim too. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> you said, "Look, look, look! What is it? I ha I have some friends who who I actually I think I told this story that when when I was in Germany I met this guy and he said that he had a friend, Pakistani friend, who married a German woman and then he made her convert to Islam. She ran into my videos. Mm -hmm. And then she started watching and she's like, what the hell? And then she said, hey, husband, have a look at this. What this guy is saying from your country? Look what he's talking about. And then mm -hmm. he ended up becoming an ex-Muslim too. <laughs> so, so it does yeah. happen. But but the but the beautiful part is, you know, like, and again, you're one of the lucky ones that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that your marriage did not fall apart. Because unfortunately, we know of people as well where their marriages yeah. fall apart because one person becomes an atheist and they, yeah. because Islam is such a totalitarian religion that it actually wants to, you know, like it, it wants to, it wants to even know what you're doing inside of your bathroom, you know, like how are you, how you're playing with yourself, <laughs> you know, how, you know, there's a dua before, there's a prayer before sex as yeah, well, there's yeah, a prayer yeah. before entering the toilet and there's a prayer after entering the toilet. So yeah. it's, it's such a control freak religion. So, yeah. Obviously, it's natural that if one person loses faith, then the other person thinks that, oh, I'm committing zina, I'm committing adultery because this cursed person is no longer a Muslim. So I'm happy that it didn't damage your relationship. With your yeah, wife. I think my wife is quite educated as well. So, but she is a born Muslim. And, uh, in, and she's, she's been wearing hijab even since she was seven, eight years old. And she never misses any prayers. That's how <laughs> obedient she was. I think um, when I started talking to her about this, things first started off with hadiths. Oh, by the way, I've read your book as well. I have a oh. copy of your book. <laughs> Thank hadith. you. Yeah. And um, I bought it through Amazon. Yep. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Please leave a good review. <laughs> yeah. 
And then I started talking about the hadiths and all that. Because she's an intelligent lady, she managed to grasp a lot of things. But I must say that when the hadith was easy to reject, but when it came to Quran, she took quite a while to, to you know, to get a head out of the thing that this is not word of God. And uh, I wouldn't say it was totally my influence, even though I pointed to a lot of things in the Quran and so on and translation, but she read the Quran herself and then she made her own decision. So... So let me get this straight. So, so obviously you inspired her, you encouraged her to read the Quran and you were obviously yeah. showing her the hadiths and something. And so yeah. she goes, okay, and this is the primary step. This is the first chink in the armory. Yeah. Yeah. When, they, when they read the hadiths, they say, oh, I'm going to become a Quranist now, which is obviously, you can say that this is, the, the, this is a fallback position. This is like, yeah. okay, this is a receding force. So you know, whoa, okay, you're falling back. But to be honest, if you can take the hadith out of a Muslim's life, then they become nominal Muslims or what I call lipstick Muslims. So they become very, they become toothless. Okay. So because all the dreams for Sharia, all the dreams for hijab, all, all these things actually go away. Maybe not the hijab, but but the dreams of taking over the world, they actually do go away. Um, because most of the, I mean, uh, apart from the major hadith punishments, etc., but most of the laws and all the, this Islamic world domination, Darul Herb, etc., all of that motivation comes from the hadiths yes it is mentioned in the quran but but the quran so you said okay read the quran she's already falling back she's already yeah. saying okay this doesn't make sense and then she goes to the quran and then she leaves islam yeah and interesting I mean, even though i mean i come from a country where there's majority muslims and most of them do not even know what's in the quran oh yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> they know how to recite it but they don't know what's in the quran so that, yeah. that same thing happened to my wife as well. She knows how to recite the Quran, but she never actually paid attention to what's in the Quran. The, so when I started pouring some you know, oil onto the fire, so then she realized that she started reading the Quran by herself, and then she realized that it doesn't sound like a book from God. <laughs> and then... Yeah, when sun she, setting in the muddy waters. and uh, You, know, so you can see the picture that I have. The sun is setting in the muddy water. <laughs> it's very <laughs> but but you know like i enjoy reading the hadiths to be honest yeah but i hate reading the quran it's such a poorly written repetitive yeah. pathetic like i'm sorry yeah. but it's a, it's, a, it's a very repetitive it's a very boring book yeah. and then you go like oh, it's the same thing over and over again and then there's so much yeah. repetition it's like it's not even a good poetry book by the way so anyway so it's a, so okay so last question so what are you now? Like, first of all, are you guys happily married? And what are you now? Are, are, are you thinking that I'm going back to my civilizational Hindu state? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, we are both still happily married. And uh, she has uh, dropped off a lot of things. Like she has stopped praying five times a day. But she still prays about once or twice because she still believes in God. It's a habit. All right. Yeah. Uh, right. And, and surprisingly, I never asked her to do this, but about... I think probably about six months ago, for the first time, she took off her hijab and went to the town. <laughs> so, wow. And this wow. is not something I asked her to do. <laughs> Did, I never asked her to do that. So you're good. You didn't, you didn't force her. So, uh, but, but those of you, the, those people who actually don't know, like I, 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 can, I can actually sympathize with women who take off their hijab for the first time. Mm -hmm. It's not like you run out of, you've just come out of, prison you it must be very do it, it is actually very daunting for yes. them as well it's like it's like imagine you just have to like if you've never gone out without your shirt and you just go out you f and you just take your shirt off and then you go out like you wouldn't feel like you you would feel naked and this is how every woman who's ever taken off their hijab yeah. they tell me that they feel like you know like i've left something behind i'm uncovered i'm dirty maybe but it's a big Big freaking step. But obviously, once you come out of that state of mind, then it gets easier. I mean, she's still in that phase because intermittently she still wears it when whenever she feels that some of her friends might see her somewhere when she's going. But uh, she has becoming, I mean, she's taking off more frequently recently. And this is not something that I influence. I never said anything to her. So she has made up her own mind. Um, I just point her to the side where she needs to go and do her research. And um, yeah, and we, our marriage is still going on as it is. There's no issues. 
So that's that's very really good to know. And you're obviously a good man. But well, sorry, I said one last question, but definitely, definitely one last question. So how your friends and family took it? Okay. Um, my side, of course, not an issue. They are all majority are mostly still, <laughs> you know, original. Most Hindus out there don't care. If yeah. anything, they'd be happy. <laughs> yeah. On her side, of course, she hasn't said officially anything to any one of them. All right. But she does... They would notice if she takes off her hijab or then she would yeah. put it on in front yeah. of them. I think eventually they will <laughs> find out. But one interesting thing is she, in a group, uh, her friend's WhatsApp group, and she has posted some of these hadiths into that group, and they kicked out. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Madia say, say, said the same thing as well. It, it's, it, I always say this, is it's akin to that infamous Tom Cruise moment on Oprah Winfrey's mm -hmm. show, on Oprah Winfrey's couch when he jumped on the couch, and he said, when you're in love, you want to tell the whole world. So okay. it's like the same thing. So when women, or, or even men, for that matter, mm -hmm. when they realize... Man, this is so stupid. I believed in this. Look, are you an idiot? You believe in this? And then people are like, they're not in that state. Uh, they're not at that level. They're like, what? How dare you say this? Get out. Block. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it happens. But, well, thank you very much for sharing yeah. your stories, uh, story yeah. with, with us. And uh, uh, very yeah. nice to hear and give my uh, respect, uh, regards to your wife. And uh, let me tell both of you. I mean, obviously, probably not that much of a big deal for you. And maybe... Maybe not so much for her as well because you guys are living in Australia. Which, uh, yeah. But but I, I can understand still always more difficult for women as well. But um, just tell her it's going to get easier. Trust yeah, me, it's going to get yeah. easier and you're just going to love and enjoy life and your, your life yeah. is going to have more. You're still at our early stage yeah. of moving out. So <laughs> yeah. no. you'll be okay. Thanks, All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Nostradamus. Thank you very much. Have a, have a good one. All right, people. That was a good, that was a good story. Uh, where, where's that guy that uh, my my Muslim apologist guy from? I don't know. I think he's from Sydney. Uh, he's been, he said that I want to Harris. Uh, I want to challenge Harris on morality and atheism. But why don't you come? Like every time you say that, I should, I put my link there. So there you go. I challenge Harris Sultan on his beliefs about atheism and morality. Like I mean, and, and right next to it, here it is. I shared the link. Um, oh yeah, Tina is reminding me of all the things that I need to talk about. All right, Tina, I know, I know, I know. Okay, don't worry, I've, I've got this. Uh, there's so many other things, and I obviously always talk about the rising radical fanaticism, Hindu fanaticism in India. It doesn't make a lot of people happy. It makes my Indian friends very unhappy. But I need to talk about this. My allegiance is with humanity and human rights, not necessarily with any one tribe. Um, but people assume that just because I'm an ex-Muslim, I would automatically become pro-radical Hinduism guy. But that's not going to happen. So I've been warning uh, and I've been noticing this trend of rising radical Hinduism in India. And uh, today I actually interviewed Arvind Saharan. He's a very balanced guy from India. Uh, the interview is on my Udu channel. Go check it out if you do speak Urdu in Hindi. So have a look at this one. What just happened here? Mob, a mob of 200 radical Hindus, obviously Muslims wouldn't do it, and I'm pretty sure they weren't Christians. Definitely they weren't Hindus, uh, Buddhists. A mob of 200 uh, radical Hindus attack mosque in Gurugram, threaten worshippers. So they attacked this um, mosque in this town, in this village, Gurugram. And then they beat up the locals. And then they... Um, have been reported till today evening. I don't know. These are some visuals from that. And, um, and obviously you can see these guys. And they beat up the local Muslims. And they threatened to, uh, to kick them out of the village, expel them from the village. Uh, but it seems like it's just gonna. I, I've been saying this for a long time that this argument is gelling. Everyone will will burn in this fire, uh, this fire of uh, these flames. So everyone will burn in this inferno of religiosity, um, or everyone will be engulfed. It, it doesn't have the same ring to to it in in English. But anyway, you get the point. Um, it's um, we've seen this. 
radical Islamism in Pakistan that we've seen, it's just progressively gotten worse. And is it, wherever Islam goes, it gets worse. Wherever you go, it gets worse. And the same thing is happening in India. Although these things have happened in India in the past, but the frequency is increasing because in mainstream media, there are radical Hindus uh, or politicians or popularizers, social activists, etc. They're all popularizing this Hindutva, not Hindutva, sorry, this radical Hindu narrative. Um, so... I've been warning this, I've been saying this for a long time, and this is a reason why after so many years, you see, I don't have that many, um, you know, uh, subscribers, so to speak, uh, because India is a big country. If you, again, if I was Andrew Tate, I would do what my audience wants to hear. I would be popularizing the radical Hindu narrative to to get support. And there's so many other people who've come after me and they've skyrocketed. Why? Because they don't talk about radical uh, Hindu fanaticism. They just say, yeah, uh, they, they, they just uh, dance to the tune. So uh, it, it's just going to get worse. And I think it's sad. And the the guy I spoke with today, Arvin, he actually said the same. I was watching one of his other interviews. He said this to a Pakistani who was a, who was a Pakistani apologist, so to speak. And he said, if we don't learn from your mistake, then we're just going to end up as bad as you, meaning as pa uh, India is going to end up as bad as Pakistan. And that's what I've been saying for a long time. The Alabanization or the Pakistanization of, of India has been has been going on for a better part of a decade now. And it's just getting worse. But the more you highlight it, the more these radical Hindu fanatics, they just come and attack me. So, you know, again, it doesn't matter. Like I've said it before, like even when nobody's watching me and if I still have interest in this, I'll keep talking about this. Speaking of radical Hindu fanaticism, and this is why it, it, a lot of people say that Hinduism, some, you know, like it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's some perfect way of life, as Hindus like to call it. Have a look at this video. There are nearly some thousand Hindus, low caste, as they like to call them, because as you guys know, there's this caste issue in, um, in, in ingrained in Hinduism that enables this discrimination of, quote unquote, lower caste people. It's enshrined in Hinduism. Don't believe what these Hindus say that, oh, no, the Portuguese introduced it. Oh, no, that's just a job title or whatever. No, it's not. You, can't, you can change your job, but you can't change your caste. Uh, or the cause is Verna. Um, anyway, so so uh, you know how we have gender-based roles in Christianity and Islam. They have uh, skin, or uh, sorry, um, how should I say? How should I put it? Um, Lineage-based laws, uh, uh, roles. Lineage-based ro roles. So uh, you know, like if you're uh, so and so, so you need to clean the streets. Uh, if you're so and so, you need to. Uh, wipe my shoes or be a cobbler or whatever so but you can never get out of that so that's casteism so what that does it it has there's a huge segment of india and apparently the majority of indian population that actually consists of the elites and scs scheduled castes and obcs as they like to call them other backward castes etc so so there's growing disenchantment of these people against mainstream hinduism so what they do they end up becoming buddhist for some reason so have a look at this one um, this video, it's comical. I don't endorse this, but it's actually funny that people are so simple-minded because there's this problem. These problems exist in Hinduism. People say, "Well, I don't want to have anything to do with this." So have a listen to this. Brahma Vishnu or Maheshko, Brahma Vishnu or Maheshko, Kabi Ishwar nahi manunga, Kabi Ishwar nahi manunga, or nahi unki puja karunga, nahi unki puja karunga. Me. राम और कृष्ण को राम और कृष्ण को ईश्वर नहीं मानूंगा ईश्वर नहीं मानूंगा और ना ही उनकी कभी पूजा करूंगा और ना ही कभी उनकी पूजा करूंगा मैं मैं गौरी गणपति गौरी गणपति आदि आदि हिंदू धर्म के हिंदू धर्म के किसी भी देवी देवताओं को किसी भी देवी देवताओं को नहीं मानूंगा नहीं मानूंगा और ना ही उनकी पूजा करूंगा और ना ही उनकी पूजा करूंगा ईश्वर ने अवतार लिया ईश्वर ने अवतार इस पर मेरा विश्वास नहीं है इस पर मेरा विश्वास नहीं है मैं ऐसा कभी नहीं मानूंगा मैं ऐसा कभी नहीं मानूंगा कि तथागत बुद्ध तथागत विष्णु के अवतार है विष्णु के अवतार ऐसे प्रचार को मैं ऐसे प्रचार को मैं पागलपन पागलपन और झूठा प्रचार समझता हूँ झूठा प्रचार समझता हूँ मैं श्राद्ध पक्ष 
कभी नहीं करूंगा और ना ही कभी पिंड दान करूंगा मैं बुद्ध धम्म के विरुद्ध कभी कोई बात नहीं करूंगा मैं कोई भी क्रिया कर्म ब्राह्मणों के हाथों से नहीं करवाऊंगा मैं इस सिद्धांत को मानूंगा कि सभी मनुष्य एक समान है मैं समानता की स्थापना के लिए प्रयत्न करूंगा मैं तथागत बुद्ध के अष्टांग मार्ग का पूरा पालन करूंगा मैं तथागत बुद्ध के बताए हुए बताए हुए दस पारमिताओं का दस पारमिताओं का पूरा पालन करूंगा पूरा पालन करूंगा मैं प्राणी मात्रा पर दया रखूंगा और उनका लालन पालन करूंगा मैं चोरी नहीं करूंगा मैं झूठ नहीं बोलूंगा मैं झूठ नहीं बोलूंगा मैं व्यविचार नहीं करूंगा so apparently there are thousands of people who um, took this oath and uh, basically they converted to Buddhism. And uh, that just shows you how simple are people because they like, I'm, I'm not going to steal, I'm not going to rob or whatever. You need a religion for that. Do you really need a religion for that? Um, so yeah, that's just, um, it's sad. Yeah, ra ra raising their hands is a bit too much. Uh, and also the style of it. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about something lighthearted and something funny. Maybe, well, okay, I, I don't know. Well, Kenuri is not here to tell me that this is not funny, but I think it is funny. Um, so let's have a look at this one. Um, we know... What, what, what do they call it? Internalized misogyny and Islam enables that. Have a look at this one. How these women, um, where is it? Let me play this video. So this is straight from Malaysia and there's a group of women who, who think that this is appropriate. Uh, listen to this. Oh. Hmm. Oh, then it's gonna bring then it's gonna bring all these these dirty diseases. Um, that's internalized misogyny. Now we know women in free societies cheat as well, so that can only happen. That uh, it means that she could also have needs that are not being fulfilled by her husband. So why would these women not allow it? I mean, if 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 I was there. I would have asked, what about your needs? I'm sure she would have said, no, 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 I don't have any needs. My needs are satisfied. I'm I'm happy with my man. But we know that, that that's not true. Because if that was true, then women would not cheat. Women do cheat. Um, so it means um, um, it's a pretty lopsided affair. Naz is saying, I don't know why there are so many radical Hindus following Harris. Because they love to see me bash Islam. That's the reason. And then when I say, hang on a second, I'm an atheist. I'm, I'm not going to endorse your radical uh, uh, Hindu fanaticism. But then they just get upset. I said, no. Well, how dare you? I thought you were... Come back to your roots, Harris. Your ancestors were Hindus. So why don't you become a Hindu? Come back to your roots. And it's a it's quite a common argument where they say 
Uh, I, and I think they've said that to Armin Nawabi as well. Go back to your old Persian roots. <laughs> India is probably the only country. Uh, okay, okay, maybe not the country because Hindus, when it comes to religion, they um, the, the, that they have this civilizational dogma, whereas Muslims have this religious dogma, which is not bound by or which is not confined to a ge geographical location. But Hindus, obviously, because Hindus have always existed in subcontinent region. So so they have this civilizational dogma where they're more proud of their history and civilization. So they think that the rest of the world should also take pride in their ancient past, which is a recipe, which is a recipe for disaster because your ancients didn't know. They didn't even know whether the sun goes around the earth or the other way around. They, they didn't even know that. So how would they, you know, like, what, why should we, okay, fair enough, they existed, you acknowledge that, but you, wh why do you have to be them? Um, I, I think Sam Harris once said uh, he was giving a lecture in, um, or, uh, yeah, probably, or, or a speech or a debate uh, um, at Oxford, and he said, I don't care how many of you prestigious people are sitting here, I don't care how fancy your degrees are or how uh, illustrious your... Uh, your ancestral roots are, but if we go far back long enough, your ancestors were giving uh, human sacrifices. That's true. No matter how far back you go, your your ancestors were doing pretty abhorrent, terrible things. So I don't need to be proud of that. I mean, I can recognize that, yeah, Indus, Indus Valley was uh, ahead, of, ahead of his time. For example, Monju Daru, um, and Harappa, these guys invented toilets way before the Romans. And Romans had communal toilets. Mohenjo-daro and Texla and Harappa, these guys had personal toilets. And they, they were on the first floor. So when they would do their business, it would actually flush out of the city. It would go with such pressure. So um, uh, and all without, obviously, pumps. So, so yeah, so they did some amazing things. They made some amazing discoveries. But that's not to say that, okay, I want to go back to those days. That's some misplaced, um, there's, a, there's a word in psychology for it, um, some, some romanticism and nostalgia or something. So Hindus are probably the only group of, uh, a major group of people that actually take a lot of pride in their ancestral roots. I mean, you, you wouldn't see... Uh, if you go to Italy, you wouldn't see any Romans saying, "Ah, oh, we want to go back to the times of Julius Caesar," uh, or, or uh, I've been to both countries and to Greece. You, they would say, "Oh, yeah, we want to go back to the time of, um, you know, Aristotle and Plato or Alexander the Great." If you're a Macedonian, but no, no one, no other country has this obsession with their past the way Hindus do. So um, yeah, that's that's uh, pretty sad. All right. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Tinu sent me a list. Oh, yes. Let's talk about this. This is actually quite important. So, ladies and gentlemen, as Samuel Jackson said, hold on to your butts. After Londonistan, after Birmingham Sharif, after Bradford, after so many other places in Europe, and mainly England, um, I think Athens has a little mini Pakistan as well. Um, Germany, mini Syria, there's the, the so many, so many, so many of these no-go zones. But we always used to think that okay, no, the Americans are a bit different. Muslims in America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand are a little bit different. They're not because they came as skilled migrants. So they were already educated people as opposed to the migrants who went to Europe because they were um, either war refugees or just refugees in general. They were, you know, they get, they were ghettoized and, you know, they, 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 they didn't assimilate as they should have. But America and Canada and Australia, they're different because these guys are highly educated people. They're just coming as skilled migrants and they find good jobs, etc. And they're not ghettoizing themselves, etc. But that's wrong. Uh, there's a city called Dearborn. Where is it? Michigan, I think. Yeah, it's in Michigan. So these guys, and, and if you guys remember, there were uh, earlier this year or last year, there were some Muslims in, in, in England as well who were protesting. Uh, they were saying that we're not going to let you teach our kids 
this this uh, uh, this LGBTQ BS. Uh, obviously, Islam is inherently homophobic, uh, whereas the Western societies used to be homophobic, and they're trying to put that in the past, and they're trying to move forward, and they're trying to give respect and dignity to homosexuals and LGBTQ in general. We want to treat everyone equally with respect and the dignity that they deserve. But Islam forbids Muslims to do that. So have a listen to this one. Oh, actually, there's nothing new here. But these guys are basically protesting India-born, which is a Muslim majority. No, no, are, are, are they Muslim majority? I think they are Muslim majority. India-born has become a Muslim majority. Let me let me look it up. Are Muslims in majority in India-born? Are Muslims in majority in India-born? Uh, Dearborn is the seventh most populated city in Michigan and is home to the largest Muslim population in the United States per capita. Okay, so maybe they're not. Um, uh, okay, so the, the um, 40% of Dearborn population is of Arab origin. Okay, so pretty close, yeah, pretty close. So add in a few, few of those um, lipstick leftist, extreme leftist wokest who say, oh, Islam is the, is the most beautiful religion, then that's it. You've you've thrown this uh, say goodbye to um, enlightenment. These guys, look at this guy. They are protesting. They are protesting, and I don't think they all look uh, of Arab origin. I think a lot of them could be Pakistani, like this guy, um, Indian Pakistani. So these guys are protesting, and they say, "Oh, look at these hijabis." They're saying, "No, you can't teach our kids to respect." LGBTQ communities. That's what they're saying. They say, no, you're not allowed. We are inherently homophobic and we need to remain homophobic. That's what these guys are saying. Um, oh, so did I show that? Did I show the video? Did, did, did the video play? Tinu, can you tell me? Did the, can you tell me if the video played? No. Did it play? Tinu, did the video play? Oh no, so there was no video. Okay, so here, here it is. Have a look at this. Have a look at this, guys. Um, so this is a video. So all these um, um, Muslims are actually protesting. That's a lot of Muslims. Some hijabis there. Some. Some charming Muslim men there. There's Mohammed Hijab right there. No, I'm joking. <laughs> He's just a tall guy. So there you go. So these guys are uh, now now they're bringing their filth to the free world. The free world that worked really hard to become free. The free world uh, and, and, and say goodbye to all the... Uh, I think it's high time for LGBTQ community to say to divorce this grotesque misalignment with um with with um with radical muslims so um i don't know how that's going to work okay all right so i think i am running out i think we did speak about this we spoke about this we spoke about her no we don't need to speak about her um okay i think this is it i think i'm done Am I done? So nobody wants to come. Where, where, where's my Muslim friend? Where's my Muslim Aussie friend? Where is he? Where's my Muslim? Where's my Aussie Muslim friend? Where is he? He wanted to challenge me on my uh, atheism and my my. Um... Oh no! Okay, I remember. I remember. There's something else as well. I want to talk about. Obviously, I wanted to talk about this. So, you guys remember? Oh, no, actually, there's quite a few more things. Okay, all right, let's talk about this. Okay, so you guys know when 9 11 happened, Muslims wanted to build a mosque not so far away from Ground Zero. And then they were like, oh, you know what? Like, oh, Islamophobia. And you know, Muslims love building mosques everywhere and they love to lecture the West on inclusion and being respectful towards other other religions etc now i'm not mentioning uh, some hardcore islamic countries i'm i have an example from pakistan which is which is supposedly on paper 
respects their minorities, and in reality, obviously, they don't. But now there's a Hindu mandir construction, Hindu temple construction, was stopped in Larkana Sin, even though the government said that, okay, you can build your uh, build your temple. But here, this, here's some of these Hindus who are protesting, and they, 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 um, they, the construction of the temple was stopped uh, by some, guess who, by, uh, by, by some members of some community. <laughs> I think you could probably tell what that is. But it's just ironic that these guys um, want to lecture the world on how they should be more inclusive. There's Islamophobia. There should be no Islamophobia. There, there shouldn't be any hatred towards Muslims. Yes, and yes, according to our worldview, you should be allowed to build your mosques under checks and balances. Um, a, the government should be able to keep an eye on where the money is coming from and what sermons, what are you teaching in your sermons? And they should be in local languages, as the new Italian prime minister said, and Austrian chancellor said last year, and that we're going to monitor where the money is coming from. Follow the money. Um, so, but this is what they do in their own countries. Again, you can't blame the Pakistan government because the Sindh government actually did allow this temple to be constructed, but it was forcefully stopped. The construction work of an old Hindu temple was forcefully stopped. Valmiki Hindu community raised their issues. Um, uh, that Hindu community is unable to reconstruct the temple and is hard to perform their religious uh, festivals. And not only just religious festivals, but also religious rites as well. For example, when Hindus, um, uh, they, they burn their deceased, so they need a designated place uh, I think it's called, yeah, it's called Shimshan Khat. So they take the people there, they take their deceased there, and then they burn them on a pyre. Um, but a lot of Hindus actually face extreme difficulties to do their last rituals because they're not allowed to do it, or they don't have these places to go to. More, um, more famously, this thing happened back in uh, 2019 in Islamabad. Uh, there were two temples on the outskirts of the capital of Pakistan, but they, but the Imran Khan government allowed them to construct one in the middle of Islamabad, but then the construction was stopped. Although I think it was uh, re-allowed after those people who were causing trouble were arrested and their software ways were updated. Um, but that's just one part of it regarding the minorities of Pakistan. There are some other elements as well and i've spoken about it numerously and i need to speak it again there's uh, one sad story came out last week there was this hindu girl she was gang raped she was abducted from her house she was gang raped by uh, two men and then they threw her in a forest and then they escaped and this was also featured on uh, Pakistani uh, local news channel, not the national news channel, but it was uh, in the in the in the in the national language, but on a local channel, this news story was covered, um, and then and thankfully these guys were actually arrested. So these guys were arrested, um, but this was just obviously they were arrested because this was a case of a brutal rape. So that is definitely against the law. So um, so when you do get raped, so then. Police sometimes they do act and they do arrest them, but there's a uh, but there's another problem, which is almost always ignored. And I've we've covered that um, segment on this channel quite a few times here. Here's another girl. This is a 15 year old Hindu girl. She was abducted in sin, um, and then she was kidnapped by a Muslim man, an older man. And then she was uh, she converted she was forcefully converted to Islam. Obviously, she's fifteen. She has no agency of her own to decide whether she needs to be a Muslim or not. Um, and then uh, her mother was crying in this interview. She was obviously crying, and she was helpless. Uh, she couldn't get her daughter back, and she was pleading uh, the authorities for her daughter to be returned to her. But that didn't happen, or it hasn't happened to date. Um, According to Pakistan's own human rights organization, NGO, uh, close to a thousand women, uh, Hindu or Christian girls are abducted each year and they are converted to, they're forcefully converted to Islam and then end up becoming brides of Muslim men. Usually these girls are underage girls and usually these men are much older men. And that is a state of minorities in Pakistan. At the same time, 
Pakistan, the government of Pakistan and its proud people, citizens of Pakistan, love to lecture the world on Islamophobia while they um, pay no attention to their own human rights. So Pakistan is a lot. I, as an pa ex-Pakistani, you can call me, or an, as an ex-Muslim, I can, or I, as an atheist, I can point this out. I can talk about anti-Muslim bigotry, just like I can talk about anti-Hindu bigotry or anti minor or Kafir bigotry in, uh, in, in, in these countries. I can talk about it because I'm logically consistent. But these people are the last people on earth who should lecture anyone on minority rights or on Islamophobia if you're a Muslim. All right, I think now we're done. There's one more story. Wow, I had a lot. I had, I had loads to talk about. Okay, this is a funny news story. Feel good news story. So we have this thing called uh, love jihad in in India. Some Hindus claim they say that Muslims. Uh, seduce Hindu girls on false premises, on false promises. And they say that, um, you know, like, oh, I'm, I'm a carefree lipstick Muslim, I don't care. But then once they get married or, or or the relationship prolongs, then they force them to convert to Islam. Otherwise, sorry, honey, I can't marry you. Which is uh, manipulative, but it should not be criminal, um, in, in my view. Because, um, you know, uh, I, th I think consenting adults should be smart enough and people get fooled people get conned all the time uh, but but this is not a this this should be a moral uh crime but not necessarily a crime criminal crime um so this is why there was a law in india passed last year a love jihad law where they said that okay well you can't convert to islam well sorry i don't want the government to tell me that i can't convert to islam if i want to marry a muslim woman or a or a uh, or if I'm a woman to marry a Muslim man. But look at this. People who, again, as an atheist, I can condemn that. But Muslims can't do that. Why? Look at this. Saudi Arabia, Saudi men have been banned from marrying Pakistani women. <laughs> so lately, a lot of uh, Saudi men have been going to Pakistan and they've been marrying um, uh, Pakistani, poor Pakistani women, and then when they go there, a lot of, uh, and by the way, uh, these brides are kept in horrible conditions. I'm sure you've heard all about this. Uh, they're kept in horrible conditions, um, but often they are second, third, or fourth wives, and then, you know, when they get tired of them, then they divorce them. So it's actually, I, I reckon it's a good thing for Pakistani women. But again, this just tells you, just imagine, imagine the United States or any free country passing a law that you cannot marry a Pakistani woman or you cannot marry an Indian woman. Imagine that. This is The West used to be like this. Ages, I don't know, when was interracial marriage banned uh, or, or uh, the ban from interracial marriages was lifted? I don't know, a long time ago. But these countries are still living in medieval times. This is how bad it is. Um, so anyway, so Saudi Arabia has imposed a new law banning Saudi men from marrying not only women from Pakistan, but also from Bangladesh, Chad and Burma. The law also imposes restrictive rules on men marrying Moroccan women. Why Moroccan women? Aren't they supposed to be Arabs? Quoting Saudi daily Makkah newspaper, the home of Islam, the report states that Saudis will not be able to marry citizens of four nationalities. Why do they name four nationalities? Well, I mean... So they, so they can marry blonde Swedish women. The director of Makkah police, Major General Asaf Qureshi, told the Saudi paper that the marriage requests from outside Saudi Arabia are made through official procedures under very strict terms. One of the restrictions is that the age gap between the couple cannot exceed 25 years. That's not a bad thing, actually. But in order to marry outside the Gulf Cooperation Council, Saudis must submit an application to a, a government committee and wait for their approval or rejection. The applications can take a long time to be processed. The government has not given any official statement clarifying the new restrictions on marrying foreigners. How could they say it? This is obviously a um, discriminatory law. But who is going to ask? But as we discussed earlier, that the United States is now turning anti-Saudi Arabia because of rising oil prices or cutting down or, or, or the NOPAC law that the Congress is looking to pass. All of a sudden, we're going to start seeing the United States condemning 
the human rights abuses or these kind of bigoted or discriminatory laws in Saudi Arabia. Stay tuned. I think it's coming. I reckon that's that's uh, so that that's what the United States is now going to do. But the United States has been mum on the human rights abuses of Saudi Arabia for a very long time. But better late than never, I guess. Okay. Um, I reckon. I think this is it. I think we're done. Yes, we're definitely done. Uh, let me see if there's anything else left. Oh, yes, there was some, uh, there's one more funny video. Yeah, I think I should talk about this. There's this funny video. Somebody sent me this funny video from, uh, from another TikToker. Have a look at this one. These guys are just next level. As I said earlier, that I as an atheist can condemn these kind of things. I, as an atheist, I can say that, hey, the government, whether it's French government or any other government, they have no business in telling women what they can or what they cannot wear. I, as an atheist, I can say it because I'm an individualist. Yeah, I respect people's individual freedoms. But Muslims can't. Why? But listen to this guy. Look what he's doing, what he's saying. Look at this. So he's upset. He's upset that Swedish government is going to, uh, sorry, Swiss government is going to apply a 900 pound fine if you wore a niqab, not a hijab, a niqab. This guy had a very big, halal, bushy beard, but would he, would these guys ever make, um, would they ever speak up for Iranian women who are being killed for uh, uh, because uh, they're forced to wear a hijab and if they take it off, uh, then they are brutally beaten up. Let me share some uh, other news stories. Look at this one. Morality police. Saudi police question women accused of wearing indecent clothing. Would this guy say no? He, you know what he would say? He would say no. Well, their country, their, law, their laws, their rules, their country. So don't go there. So can we reverse the same argument? Well, if you don't like it, leave it. I don't believe in that, but I'm saying... By going by your logic, I reckon you should stay there and fight for your rights and you should strive for better rights. I, I This is what I believe in. But again, there's a hypocrisy at play. I can't be labeled a hypocrite because I say women should be allowed to rip off their hijabs and women should not be forced to wear any hijabs. Uh, but that's not it. Listen to this one. Saudi Arabia arrests hundreds, hundreds for wearing inappropriate clothes. Indecency, right. Amnesty condemns trial of Moroccan women who wore too, too tight dresses. The dresses were too tight. They weren't even naked. Oh, let's go to Egypt as well. Egyptian actress charged with obscene act for wearing the revealing dress at a at Cairo Film Festival. So, and, and again, this is just like two minutes worth of Google search, and I'm sure you can find all these searches. So, so how come these Muslims, on one hand, they say... Sorry, you can't force us not to wear a niqab. You can't fine us for wearing a niqab. But then on the other hand, they impose criminal sanctions or they support them. Again, okay, this guy's not responsible for it, but he supports it because he's never spoken about it. He's never condemned Iran or Saudi Arabia or any other country, where or Algeria, Morocco, Egypt, where they incarcerate women, torture women, beat up women, fine women. Fine is actually... I'll take the fine. I don't think the fine. They they do worse um, uh, for wearing too tight dresses or too revealing clothes or wearing a skirt. These guys are just a bunch of hypocrites. And um, this is why, you know, uh, nobody, nobody can take them seriously. And this guy with a bushy beard, again, I don't know where he lives, but I'm sure he lives in, in, in the West. Oh, actually, his accent probably shows that he lives in England, I think. But um, but yeah, but he wouldn't go back. Okay. All right. I think I, I'm pro I promise I'm I'm definitely done. Let me let me go through it again. Yes, definitely done. Yep, cover that, cover that, cover that. Done, people. This has been another proud presentation of actually no, hang on. This is the last episode of um Okay, let me. Let, okay, so let me let me give a proper send off. Um, so so I I Nuria had been telling me about this for a, for quite some time now that she was finding it very overwhelming. Um, 
that she was doing this and work and also juggling through her masters so much so that i think she put her masters on hold for a little bit um and obviously as you could see that what's been happening in iran and she went to these protests so i you can you can obviously appreciate that this is very overwhelming for people and i would also like to tell you that you know it i may not show it but it could get overwhelming for me too so i just need a little pat on the back um activism can be a very lonely very lonely lonely activity um and a lot of people um can take it to heart and it can get very difficult at times to keep talking about it and keep getting attacked by people especially people like me or nuria as well no, no, uh, okay what i'm about to say not nuria so much in that case but in my case um i i get attacked from radical hindu fanatics i get attacked by radical muslim fanatics uh, i get i i get attacked from all sides uh with uh with very little reward um so i have also been thinking for for past couple of months that i'm i'm i might just put it on hold Be, and not necessarily i'm tired of it i've always said it that um if i do get bored of uh doing doing this then i might take a break uh, uh but but in my case it's not necessarily a uh, you know like i'm not overwhelmed emotionally or anything but i'm just um i'm, I'm there are a few other things happening in my life as well uh where i want to focus on my business because when covid happened my agency business those of you who don't know i had a uh, i've had an acting the agency where i've uh, represented actors and models where i would find them work but then covid happened and then a couple of people uh, wrote to my clients uh, from one of the partner agencies um and they complained they said hey look at this this is why i never really advertise what i do uh, because it gives ideas to people so all of a sudden the work dried up but it didn't really matter because you know like i mean I've, i still i still do a lot of other things as well but after covid this thing actually became my only um i would say work per se um not necessarily just financially all the way but i i have some other little financial things as well but but you know don't get me wrong but this financial incentive was here as well uh to make money from ads revenue and uh, super chats and all that um uh, but that was never the reason because as i said that i when i started my activism in 2017 there was no money until 2020 i think or in end of 2019 and, and even that money is not that much so that was never the motivation um uh, but as i said because i was not working i wasn't doing my other business as much uh, my acting agency business dried up so i could put all my attention to this but now i'm thinking i have some other business ideas that i want to do um so i've been thinking about that so that's what i've been thinking but again this is not really a goodbye yet because i'm actually not sure um i'm just kind of losing interest in uh, it, it, and some people might have noticed that my urdu streams have also they used to be 5 6 hours and now they're just getting shorter and shorter because i'm 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 kind of getting bored at this so um uh, i i wouldn't say that i'm fully bored to say goodbye yet um but i think i'll i'll, I'll for the timing i'll keep doing i'll i'll see how it works i'll i'll see how my other uh, doing the day business activities work out um but uh, to be honest i actually do enjoy uh, secular jihadists a lot now and do, spoke with vidu as well so i think we we're, we're probably going to uh, do that i think i'm enjoying that one so that would definitely stay on for a bit uh but with the with the solo show uh cuz now that nuria is gone as well i was um uh, i i don't know i'll i'll try i i don't know let me let me think about it i'll i'll probably i'll probably do uh, I'll, i'll try to do a couple of episodes of um um uh, of um house of sin i'll, I'll bring it back uh, and uh, and if there are any other people who want to who are interested in co-hosting with me um doesn't matter what gender doesn't matter what background ex muslim or ex christian or whatever uh i think it'd be interesting uh so do send me an email to harisultanxmuslim@gmail.com um and i'll consider that um so i'm deep is saying so you only did shows because you enjoy it yeah i mean i do have to enjoy it you don't care about telling the truth while i enjoy it <laughs> that's pretty stupid of you um 
Amandeep, I think you sound like one of those people who just want to, you know, find ants in my pants. Yeah, <laughs> you you have to enjoy it. Uh, otherwise, if you don't enjoy it, then you don't do it. it it's uh, just for views and enjoyment. Oh, you added the views part. Yeah, clever man. Sneakily enjoy. I enjoyed it. And there's nothing wrong with that, boy. I enjoyed it. And as long as I keep enjoying it, I actually said it a long time ago that uh, Muslims will either have to kill me or they will have to pray for the day when I get bored of this. I've sa I said it like four years ago, man. So you need to update it, uh, update your knowledge. But um, uh, but yeah. I was looking at your face. I can, I, 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 I I'm getting a few jokes, but no, I wouldn't say it. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Okay, guys. So that was it. Let's just uh, don't take the last words too seriously because as I said, like I'm I'm just getting bored a little bit, but not necessarily entirely. So, you know, it's a bit of both. So let's just see how it goes. All right, people. Until next time, next week. Next week, I'll definitely be back with uh, with House of Sin. Ta-da, bye-bye.